Chapter 181, 1990 Mary had her first child that year, a little girl she named Rachel after her mother, Rachel Marlene. Not gonna lie, she told Remus over the phone. I'm praying she's a squib, can't be dealing with all this nonsense. She invited him to the christening, and he went out of obligation. It had been decades since he'd set foot in a church, and this was a huge Catholic one in Croydon. Grant didn't come, and said he was too scared he'd burst into flames when he crossed the threshold. That's ridiculous, Remus sighed, tired and humorless. Mary is literally a witch. If she's safe in a church... My granddad was a Bible basher, Grant shuddered. They can all do one, as far as I'm concerned. Grant was so rarely stubborn, so Remus went alone and tried not to think about funerals. After the ceremony, there was a bit of a party in the hall next door, and Mary showed off the baby. She was gorgeous, chubby with huge brown eyes and huge brown curls, and a gummy smile sure to be as dazzling as her mother's one day. Remus waved at the giggling cherub nervously and patted her soft baby hand. I'm completely obsessed with her, Mary gushed, holding her up. Want to hold her? Mary grinned, then laughed that girlish cackle which took him back years. I'm teasing you, Remus, darling. Here, I'll give her to Darren's mum for a bit. Let's you and me have a catch-up. They sat on red plastic chairs in a quiet corner of the church hall, clutching paper cups of watered-down orange squash. It was a small space filled with the noise of family celebration, children playing. Mary's family was huge and as brash and lovable as she was. Remus felt very out of place, but what else was new? You're not getting married, then? Remus asked. You and Darren? Shh, Mum will hear you, Mary giggled. She's furious, of course. She's pretending we had a small ceremony in Jamaica before Rachel was conceived. Now I don't fancy it, and we barely got the time with the garage and the new house. Remus nodded along, smiling. It felt so good to be sitting next to Mary again, to have her chattering away, full of energy and joy. So how about you, still up Soho? Mary asked, giving him an appraising look. He'd come dressed in a suit he'd bought the day before from a charity shop. It was okay. A bit seventies and too big for him, but that was the style these days anyway. Yeah, he nodded. Don't think I'll ever move, to be honest. The flat's paid for. Got a boyfriend? Mm, sort of. I know you have. Why are you always being so mysterious? Is he a muggle? Yeah. Oh, I wish you'd come and see me more often, Remus. I worry about ya. He smiled at her. You're such a mum. That made her laugh. Guilty! She was still beautiful, and looked the same at thirty as she handed eighteen in his mind. She wore a loud hot pink dress with razor-sharp power shoulders and a gleaming gold fascinator perched atop her head. She'd cut her hair short, making her face look more angular, like a Nefertiti bust. Mum keeps calling me Grace Jones. Mary touched her bare neck, self-consciously. I like it, though. Can't waste time fussing about in the mirror when I've got this little monkey keeping me on me toes. Are you working somewhere? Oh, you know, here and there, Remus shrugged non-committally. You know what it's like. You know Dumbledore gave Snape a job, Mary leaned in and whispered. Remus didn't know why. He was the only other person who knew who Dumbledore or Snape were. He's a teacher at Hogwarts. Can you believe that? Remus shrugged. Mary continued furious. This had obviously been on her mind for some time. When I think about all the suffering that snivelling coward caused, when I think about all the friends I've lost, Lily and James, Peter, Marlene, Snape wasn't responsible for their deaths. How are we to know? So what, he turns spy for two bloody weeks at the end, and that guarantees him a cushy job for life, does it? What was he doing while we were hiding in cellars like rats? Where was he when we were disappearing by the day? Mary? I just can't believe Dumbledore. Has he offered you any help? He hasn't me. Not worth his time, I suppose. They all stuck together in the end, the old families. I don't want anything from him, Remus said. Being in Dumbledore's debt is too dangerous. Anyway, Snape has to live with what he did. Just like we all do. She lowered her eyes then, and Remus knew that they were both thinking about Sirius. I tell you what, Remus, my love, she said finally. I don't care if she's magic or not. That baby girl won't be cannon fodder for that old bastard. 
Next time that lot want a war, you and me are going to be smart enough to keep well out of it, all right? Too right, Remus replied. They could agree on that, at least. He'd join the werewolves again before he'd ever rejoin the Order. You know, having Rachel makes me think about Harry, she said wistfully. Now I've got a child of my own. I just don't know how Lily and James did it. Remember, we were all just kids playing Mummy and Daddy, weren't we? I suppose, yeah. He'll be starting Hogwarts next year, Harry. What? That's not right. He must only be... Remus struggled to do the maths in his head. Shit, he said. I didn't even think. Poor little love, going to school with no parents to see him off. Mm. Oh my gosh, Remus, I wasn't thinking. It's fine, he chuckled. I've got over being an orphan by now. He stayed for about a half hour before heading off to catch his bus in the cold dark of an early winter evening. He clutched two slices of cape, wrapped in pink paper napkins. One for you, one for your sort of boyfriend, Mary winked as she handed them over. He kissed her cheek and she stretched up on her tiptoes to hug him. She smelled the same and it made him want to cry. Love you, sweetheart, she whispered. I'm so pleased to see you getting back to yourself. He gave her a half smile, congratulated her again and left. She was right. He was getting back to himself. Or if not that, becoming somebody else. Somebody who was coping. He'd kicked fags and booze. He rarely spent afternoons staring at his bedroom ceiling, unable to get dressed. Sometimes weird things made him anxious, like the smell of motor oil or when they played old Bowie songs on the radio. Once he'd seen a teenage girl with ginger hair get off a bus in Finsbury Park and almost followed her home. He was doing better. Sometimes he could even think about Sirius. Sometimes he could talk about him only to Grant, and only if he asked. Funny things, like pranks they'd done at school or stupid in-jokes. He didn't think about them being together. He'd turned Sirius into a different person in his mind, just another character from his school days. That made things much easier. After the christening on the way home, Remus thought about Harry. He hoped the kid was happy, or at least that he wasn't angry. Remus tried to picture himself, aged eleven, crossing through the barrier at King's Cross for the first time. It had been nerve-wracking and exhilarating, and he hadn't known how to act, just how to relate to anyone else. And then he'd met James, the first friendly face on the train that day. It was too cruel that Harry would never know him. Remus was in danger of getting nostalgic now and weepy, so he got off the bus to walk the rest of the way home. He was tired by the time he got in, and his hip hurt, but that was okay. He felt good about having left the house. All right, sunshine! Grant called from the kitchen as Remus shut the front door. Hiya. How was it? Church was a bit boring. Seeing Mary was nice. Oh, good. Grant came through to lean in the door frame. He was drying a dish they'd used last night. Leave that, I'll do it, Remus said, collapsing into the couch. No, it's done. Mary invited us for dinner. They live out in Hounslow, though. Bit of a trek. But if you fancied it... Oh, she knows who I am now. Grant smirked. Sort of, Remus blushed. She knows I'm seeing someone, just... For nine years, Remus. Sorry, it's just weird because... Mary knew me back then, you know. She knew you back when you were with Sirius, Grant said flatly, turning back into the kitchen to put the plate away. Don't be like that, Remus said, getting up stiffly. I'm not being like anything. Grant's face was hidden by the cupboard door. I invited you to the christening. You didn't want to come. You know bloody well why, too. You hate churches. I know. Well, then. Why are we fighting? Remus frowned, confused. This isn't fighting. Grant closed the door to the cupboard, sighing. What is it, then? It was ten years ago, that's all. You're still acting like I don't matter as much as he did. What? No, that's mad, that's... That's all I want to say. Grant raised a hand to stop him. Like I said, this isn't a fight. But Grant, I don't... You're wrong, I swear. I want you to meet Mary, I do. I'm going for a walk, okay? I need some air. Grant pushed past him to the door. He took his coat off the hook, the coat Remus had bought him last Christmas. I'll be back in an hour or so. 
Take a paracetamol for your hip, will ya? You're limping again. Chapter 182, 1991 Saturday, 9th of March, 1991 Have you seen my wand? Nope. Bugger! Where did you last have it? If I knew that, I wouldn't be looking, would I? All right, all right, keep your hair on. Grant emerged from the bathroom, smelling of toothpaste and pantene. Remus had almost turned the living room upside down in his search. He stood in the middle of the mess, running his fingers anxiously through his hair. I've got a million exam sheets to mark today. I really need it. Just do it without magic like the rest of us mortals, Grant shrugged, lifting the couch cushions to help him look. I can't. I really need my wand, Remus huffed, looking under the TV table. Shame there ain't a spell to find it, eh? Grant chuckled. Then he saw Remus's face and turned serious, raising his hand. All right, don't worry, we'll find it. Right, last time you used it, um... But when the lights went, right? Last night? Oh, yeah! Remus rushed into the bathroom. He'd been having power cuts at least twice a week for the past month. Remus thought that was all over now the miners were back to work, but apparently not. His wand had rolled under the bed. He snatched it up, relieved, and held it tight in his fist. Thank Merlin, he whispered to himself. Got it? Grant asked as Remus turned to the living room. Grant was straightening out the mess Remus had left. Remus flicked his wand triumphantly, and the room reordered itself. Grant made a noise of surprise and delight. Clever, Cogs, he grinned. Remus poked his tongue out and went to organise his pile of papers. Still don't see why you need your wand. Does it speed things up or something? No, I needed to read, Remus replied, sitting down at the dining table to work. Huh? I have this spell that helps me read. Remus said. I never learned how to do it properly at St. Edmund's. You can't read? Grant had his hands on his hips, staring at Remus in disbelief. Well, I can a bit, Remus said, feeling defensive. Just not very well. The words get all jumbled up. I don't know why. Oh, Grant said, sitting down next to him. You're dyslexic. I'm what? Remus frowned at him. He'd never heard that word. It sounded like a spell. Dyslexic. They used to call it word blind. Nothing wrong with your IQ. It's a connection between your eyes and your brain or something. I read somewhere about it when I was studying education, trying to get them to acknowledge it at work. I reckon a few of the boys need extra help, but the governor just reckons they're thick. Yeah, that's what they told me, Remus frowned. Wait, so it's a real thing? Of course it is, Grant shrugged. Bloody amazing you've got a spell for it. Show me. Remus did, but of course there wasn't very much to see, and he couldn't do it on Grant. He made a mental note to look up dyslexia when he had some free time, if he could figure out how on earth to spell the stupid word. I'll leave you to finish then, Grant said. Remember our plans tonight? Oh yeah, Remus sighed. Well, if I finish in time, maybe. No, Grant shook his head firmly. We're going, Remus Lupin. I'm dragging you into the 90s, kicking and screaming if I have to. Remus laughed half-heartedly, trying to ignore the gnawing dread in the pit of his stomach. It was his thirty-first birthday tomorrow, and Grant had decided this was the year Remus would finally go to his first gay bar. As March approached, Remus just wanted to hide until the day was over, like always. Birthdays always reminded him of the marauders. You ought to get out a bit, Grant kept saying. Meet people. I hate people, Remus would reply acidly. People voted for Thatcher and keep buying Morrissey's records. People are idiots. Grant laughed. People are great. Art, sex, coffee, conversation. Can't have those without people. People are what makes it all worthwhile and you know it. He was right. Grant was generally right about humanity. And the world had certainly changed. Remus had missed out as usual, immersed in the war or locked up in his grief. Grant returned him to the outside world like an explorer with fantastical stories to tell. Things were different now for people like them. Queers, more appropriately these days, gay men. Just over two decades ago it had been a crime to live the way they did, and there had been plenty of bumps in the road since then, which couldn't stop progress. As the 80s drew to a close, it seemed gay people were everywhere. Grant made London sound like one big massive coming out party. He told Remus about once seeing Freddie Mercury in heaven, 
The Pet Shop Boys playing on the radio. Frankie Goes to Hollywood was number one again. Boy George's makeup. Even Elton John was gay now. So Remus thought it was probably time he at least tried to get involved. They went to a small bar just round the corner. I don't think you're ready for heaven yet, Grant teased him. Remus wished he wouldn't make fun. He was more nervous than he expected to be. I won't fit in, he said, checking his face in the little mirror by the front door. He was looking old. Thirty-one. Jesus Christ, only yesterday he'd been seventeen. It's a gay bar, Grant tutted, standing behind him with an amused expression. You're gay. You'll fit in. I don't know if I'm that kind of gay, though, Remus replied, tousling his greyed hair to see if that improved anything. No, really, just made him look a bit scruffier. Won't they be, I don't know, younger? More fun? You're loads of fun, Grant said. Remus met his eyes in the mirror and raised an eyebrow. Grant snickered. Well, I think you're fun. I'm not going to make you dance, don't worry. Let's stay in and get a Chinese, Remus pleaded one last time. No, Grant shook his head, smiling. You promised me, one hour minimum. Come on. So he went. Maybe he was getting soft in his old age. Remus was right. The crowd in the little bar was younger and more fun. There were a few people older than him, which made him feel a little bit less out of place, and at least all the coloured lights hid his grey hair. When Remus was a little boy at St. Edmund's, the one TV show everyone had agreed on wanting to watch was Top of the Pops on Friday evenings. They'd gathered round the tiny fuzzy black and white screen, and through the blizzard of static watched the trendy young people dancing along to their favourite pop songs. St. Edmund's boys lads were particularly fans of Bad Lord, the bouncy blonde lead dancer of Pan's People, top of the pop's in-house dance troupe. That studio looked like the coolest place on earth to eight-year-old Remus, and he was instantly reminded of it as he followed Grant into Boys. Except the devotees of Busty Babs would have been very disappointed, because the clientele in here were decidedly male. Oh my god, Remus thought to himself as he walked through the busy dance floor to the bar. Are they all gay? Do they know I'm gay? Oh my god. Do you want to calm down there, sunshine? Grant gave him a look as they took up two bar stools near the light-up dance floor. I'm fine, Remus said, his voice maybe a bit too high. Stop staring, you weirdo. I'll get you a drink. But Remus couldn't help staring. Everyone was just so brazen. Tight jeans, tight shirts, or no shirts at all in some cases. And they were dancing together and laughing, kissing, and it was all just fine. No one was saying anything about it. Remus's head was spinning. Grant handed Remus a drink, a cherry cola, because he wasn't supposed to be drinking. Remus sipped it and tried not to look as out of place as he felt. He didn't know any of the music either. It was all too modern for him. God, he was old. I don't know why you said I didn't have to dance, he said to Grant. Seems like that's the only thing to do. You don't have to do anything you don't want to, Grant smiled. Relax, that's the whole point of being here. Remus tried. He was glad it wasn't a busy night. He didn't think he'd be able to cope with a crowd. He sat on his stool and sipped his coke and looked around without staring, and eventually it felt a little bit less scary. He felt a bit twitchy when a drag queen sidled up to him. Six foot ten in pink PVC platform boots and a Dolly Parton wig, but she fluttered her massive eyelashes at him and held out a cigarette. What a light, handsome! Remus felt his cheeks burning and shook his head shyly. Sorry, he mumbled. Don't smoke. Oi, do your trick, though! Remus elbowed him. Grant elbowed him. He addressed the drag queen. Remus here does this amazing magic trick. Oh, I love a bit of magic! The glamorous stranger purred. Remus bit his lip but nodded. Uh, okay, um... He took the cigarette and put it between his own lips then snapped his fingers. The end lit at once and Remus took a quick drag for his troubles before handing it back. Blimey! The drag queen blinked, staring at the lit fag. Amazing is right. Better watch out for you, eh, magic man? Remus blushed again, looking down at his coat. Just a sleight of hand. Come here often? She leaned against the bar, smoking, the blood-red lipstick staining the fag end. Oh no, Remus said, maybe a bit too quickly. Grant laughed and put a hand on his shoulder. 
It's his first time. Brought him for his birthday. Oh, happy birthday, she smiled broadly. We'll have to play your song later. Just go and tell the DJ, okay, sweetie? Uh, okay. Remus nodded, planning to do no such thing. See you later, boys. The drag queen winked and sailed away across the dance floor. Weren't so bad, was it? Grant said. You'll be ready to march with me in the Pride Parade by July. I don't know about that, Remus laughed. He gazed at the dance floor a bit longer. The drag queen had treated him as if he'd belonged. Rather than feeling more self-conscious, he actually felt a bit happier. Everyone was nice enough. No one was being nasty or rude. He watched a couple kissing in the middle of the floor. They were really going for it. Groping each other's backside, and people were actually cheering. He remembered his friends cheering when Mary and Sirius kissed in the Gryffindor common room all those years ago. That had been Remus's birthday too, and the date of Remus and Sirius's first kiss, which had happened in the shadows. Almost all of their kisses had been hidden away, because deep down they both knew that no one wanted to see that. Not in the seventies. Not at Hogwarts. Remus had a sudden urge to do something similar here, in plain view, where everyone could see and no one would frown or cheer. Or jeer. Only he wasn't quite brave enough for public snogging just yet, even at the grand old age of almost thirty-one. So he just reached over and held Grant's hand on top of the bar. Grant blinked in surprise, but his face lit up so gorgeously that any trace of nerves left Remus completely. He sometimes forgot that Grant had feelings too, which sounded heartless, but it was only because Grant so rarely complained. Happiness looked so good on him that Remus made a resolution to work harder on it. They hung round a bit longer until Remus had finished his drink. He had no desire to dance, though more than one person had approached inviting him to join them, but the experience hadn't been dreadful. He said as much to Grant, who laughed. Told you so. Thanks for coming, darling. I know it's not easy. You make it easier, Remus said softly, surprising himself. Grant looked taken aback and squeezed Remus's hand again. Bloody charmer, he said bashfully. Come on, I've got a chocolate cake waiting in the fridge at home. You can blow out the candles and we'll kiss in the dark. Remus grinned back. Sounds perfect. He nipped to the loo before leaving. He could have waited until they got home, they were only round the corner, but he felt that this was his last test of bravery. The toilets were unisex, which Remus supposed was fair enough, if a bit embarrassing. There weren't any girls about, at least. He went in and used a urinal as quickly as possible, trying to ignore the sound and scent of sex emanating from the cubicles. He was just washing his hands when the door swung open and someone closed in behind him. He spun around, surprised, and faced the stranger. What? The man grinned wide, showing his teeth. He licked his lips and sniffed the air, and then it hit Remus. The familiar scent, the instant connection, the lack of respect for personal space. A werewolf. I smelled your magic, the man said, his voice low. Delicious. Haven't seen you before. He wasn't as tall as Remus, and he was quite thin, in a skin-tight white shirt. He had long, flame-red hair, straight as a poker, and glacier-blue eyes. The scent of earthy, natural magic radiated off him in waves that made Remus giddy, blood rushing through his veins and arteries like an elixir. Hi. The stranger sniffed again. Which pack are you? You smell like Greyback. Remus balked a bit at the idea he had any of Greyback in him, but he shook his head. No pack. Brave of you. Not worried you'll get rounded up by the Ministry. What about you? Who are you with? For a moment he hoped he was one of Castor's. He desperately wanted to know how they were all doing, but the stranger just shrugged. Oh, we drift here and there. You won't have heard of us. But you know Greyback. Oh, yes. He pulled his shirt down at the collar, revealing an enormous bite mark which was all too familiar to Remus. We could go back a long way, he and I. The war. Were you? Ah, I was barely a pup back then. The werewolf raised an eyebrow. His skin was so fair that his scars were like streaks of silver, pearlescent as moonbeams. But the next war. The next war we shall be ready for. There won't be another war, Remus said. He was backed up against the porcelain sink. The werewolf had placed a hand on either side of him. He was trapped, but he'd made no move to escape. 
Not yet. Voldemort's dead. Hmm, some say, the werewolf smirked. He leaned in and licked behind Remus's earlobe. It made him shudder all over. He had to hold in a whimper. The other man pressed in on him and whispered, But I have heard that part of him lives still. The forests speak of ancient magic, of cursed blood. The Dark Lord gathers his strength. No! Remus shook his head. He tried to push back, but only succeeded in grinding their bodies together. He knew it was all lies, and he knew this man was trouble. Oh God, the scent. The scent was so heady. His body wouldn't listen to him. It only wanted one thing. Come, the werewolf kept whispering, his breath hot on Remus's neck. No more talk of war. It's not our concern just yet. I want to enjoy you. Do you live nearby? We can go anywhere you like. This is going to be so good. The moon is waxing. Remus shook his head again, as if he could rid himself of the fog of pheromones flooding his system. I am here with someone, he rasped. Bring them, if you like, the wolf chuckled. I am all for sharing. No, no, I have to go. Remus used his last shred of willpower to extricate himself from the stranger and hurry back into the bar, feeling the wolf's eyes blazing at his back. He found Grant and grabbed his shirt sleeve, hissing. We have to go home. Are you all right? Something happened. No, um, I just want to go home. I want to, I want to take you home. He met Grant's eyes, still holding his arm, and he wondered if Grant could feel it too. Feel the burning, the need. Sirius always could, but perhaps you had to be sensitive to magic? Remus focused the intensity, projecting it outwards. Grant's eyes flickered and his pupils dilated, a warm blush creeping up his cheek. All right, then. He knocked back the last of his drink and they left, running out into the busy street together, hand in hand. Chapter 183 Summer, 1993 7th of August, 1993 An owl arrived that morning, and it was as if Remus had been waiting for it all along. He was brushing his teeth when the bird landed on his bathroom window sill, brown and tawny. He recognised it at once. He would know a Hogwarts owl anywhere. It gave an official hoot and stuck out its scaly leg. Remus untied the letter, toothbrush clenched between his teeth, mouthful of froth. He spat and opened the envelope as the bird took off again, navigating the narrow buildings with the perfect ease of a predator. Mr. R. J. Lupin Professor Dumbledore wishes to pay you a visit today at about tea time. He apologises for the short notice given and hopes that you will be made welcome. No need to provide refreshments. Hoping you are well. It was not signed and had presumably come directly from the headmaster's office. Remus expected his insides to turn cold, his hands to shake, tears to prick his eyes. But nothing came. He felt no reaction other than extreme tiredness. Heaving a sigh, Remus finished brushing his teeth and dressed. Grant left at some point for football practice. He'd invited Remus, he always asked, but Remus never took him up on it. He spent enough of his life watching people who were sportier than him doing sporty things. It was a Saturday and there was nothing much to do, so Remus read the paper. The Guardian. He hadn't picked up a copy of The Prophet in years, and settled in to wait. He expected that tea time was about 5pm, though you could never tell with Dumbledore. He tried to picture his old head teacher wondering whether twelve years had made much difference, and to see if he was still angry. But no, Remus didn't think he had the energy for anger any more. Maybe he'd used it all up. Restless, Remus switched on the telly, then turned it off again when there was nothing to watch but grandstand. He found himself growing agitated. What sort of person simply announced their visit the morning of? What sort of person just invited themselves over? No one but Dumbledore. It was downright rude. What if Remus had plans? He briefly wondered about teaching the old goat a lesson, walking out and going to see a film, let Dumbledore arrive to an empty flat, serve him right. But... but... Remus wanted to know. It had to be important. No one from Hogwarts or the Order had tried to get in touch since the early 80s. It could be anything. Finally, that old familiar crack sounded just outside, and there was a soft but purposeful rap at the door. He opened it quickly and found Dumbledore almost exactly as he'd remembered. Hair a bit whiter, if that was even possible, but very much the same man. A queasy feeling rose up in Remus's throat, and he felt eleven years old again. 
Professor, he said dryly, standing aside to allow Dumbledore entry. Remus, the old man smiled. How are you? Fine, Remus rubbed the back of his head. Fine, yeah. Lovely. Dumbledore's bright blue eyes darted about the room, taking in every inch of the home Remus had once shared with Sirius. Sit if you want, Remus offered. Thank you. Tea? Certainly, very kind. Remus took the opportunity to escape to the kitchen. He made the tea the muggle way, with the electric kettle, just to stay away a bit longer. Sugar? he called. Three, if you please. The old man still had his sweet tooth then. Remus remembered the sherbet lemons with reluctant fondness. Tea made, he returned to the living room and set the mugs down on his battered old coffee table, using an old copy of Private Eye as a coaster. It's been ages, Remus said, sitting in an armchair. Twelve years. I know, Remus flinched, irritated. Did Dumbledore really think he couldn't count away each passing year, every month? You're keeping well? Well enough. I get by. Do you know why I am here? the wizard asked. Remus shrugged. Having the foggiest. Dumbledore sighed very softly, then set down his mug of tea. I was somewhat afraid of that. You haven't been reading the news, then? Not your news, no. Why? Oh, dear. I had hoped you'd already... You see, Remus... He's dead, isn't he? Remus said suddenly, sharply. Black, he's dead. Dumbledore fixed him with a very intense stare. No, he said gently. He is not dead. Sirius has escaped. For a moment, Remus thought he'd misheard. Escaped. Would dead have been better? At least if Sirius was dead, then it was all over, finally. He couldn't wrap his head round what escape meant. Christ! He dropped his head into his hands. Indeed. Dumbledore sipped at his tea. Remus didn't trust himself to lift his mug, so he simply sat there, staring at the carpet. It needed hoovering badly. I take it, then, Dumbledore said evenly, that Mr. Black has not been in touch. Mr. Black. He spoke as if they were still his students. Remus just shook his head mutely, looking up. Dumbledore nodded, and Remus knew he believed him. Is he... I didn't know anyone could escape Azkaban. Sirius would be the first, Dumbledore said. He was always a very gifted wizard. Hmm. Remus couldn't think properly. He felt as if a vault of long-forgotten memories was easing open in his mind, its hinges rusty and sore. Could a dog escape the Dementors? Could a dog swim up the shore? The North Sea was so cold he shuddered to think about it. Twelve years. Honey, I'm home! Grant clattered through the door in fluorescent yellow football shorts with a terrible American accent and a cheesy grin, which froze when he saw Dumbledore. Oh, sorry. Tea party, is it? Remus stood up anxiously, rubbing his arm. Grant, I... um... this is my old head teacher. Could you give us a minute? If you want. Grant furrowed his brow, eyes darting back and forth. Should I leave? No, don't go, just... I'll wait in the other room, Grant said, understanding quickly. Remus blushed slightly. Dumbledore was sure to know that the other room was the bedroom. Grant edged around the room awkwardly. Just as he reached the bedroom door, he patted his pockets. Er, uh, Remus, got any fags? Asio Marlboros, Remus said with a twitch of his wand. The packet flew into his hand, and he withdrew one of his own, lighting it with his wand, then threw the box to Grant, who caught it deftly. Cheers, Grant nodded, retreating into the next room. Remus took a long drag, staring into space. His head swam. He rarely smoked any more. He hid a box for emergencies, and this was an enormous emergency. You perform magic in front of this young man? Dumbledore asked. Remus gave him an irritated look. What a stupid thing to care about. Yeah, yeah, statute of secrecy, he replied, tutting, flicking his ash onto the coffee table. Give me detention for it, if you like. He took another pull. Fortunately, the statute of secrecy does not apply to partners, spouses, or family members, 
Dumbledore replied calmly. And I assume he is your... Remus exhaled smoke, rubbing his head again. Well, he's not my fucking brother, Professor. Dumbledore did not flinch. I'm sorry, Remus, he said. You've had a shock. I hadn't realized you'd shut yourself off so much. I had thought... No one to shut myself off from, Remus snorted. Everyone's gone away. I wish I could give you some time to adjust to this news, but I'm afraid there is another reason I've come today. Of course there is, Remus sighed deeply. He just wanted Dumbledore to leave. He needed a drink for the first time in years. He needed to drink into a stupor to drown every thought in his head. Are you working at the moment? Here and there, Remus shrugged. What I can get? There is a vacancy at Hogwarts. Oh, yeah, Remus snorted. Phil's left, has he? Not interested. It is a teaching position, Dumbledore replied, once again demonstrating his uncanny ability to remain calm when confronted with barefaced cheek. Remus laughed rudely. Have you finally cracked, Dumbledore? You want to hire a werewolf to look after your kids now? There are measures we can take. Oh, no! Remus shook his head vehemently. You're not getting me back in that bloody shack. Advances have been made, Remus, Dumbledore said sharply. If you had kept in touch with the wizarding world, you would know this. The discovery of Wolfsbane Potion has been of enormous help to many with your condition. It would render you almost entirely harmless during your transformations. I would make it a condition of your employment. Why do you want me? Remus eyed him with renewed suspicion. What was he after? Teaching positions at Hogwarts were highly coveted. He knew that much. I think you would make an excellent teacher, first and foremost, Dumbledore said. I also thought you might appreciate the opportunity, and with the news of Black's escape, I... Ah, Remus nodded. You want me nearby, just in case. For your own protection, of course. He won't come after me, Remus said stonily. He might be mad, but he's not stupid. He's never been stupid. Not stupid, perhaps, but reckless, Dumbledore raised a snowy eyebrow. Remus conceded. True enough. What would I be teaching? History? Care of magical creatures? Defense against the dark arts, Dumbledore smiled pleasantly, now that Remus seemed to be coming around to the idea. As an ex-member of the Order of the Phoenix, I thought you would be ideal. Mm hmm There is one other thing, Dumbledore said, sounding unsure for the first time, as though he wasn't certain what Remus's reaction might be. Remus said nothing, just looked him in the eye and waited. Dumbledore set down his mug. Harry. Pain flared somewhere deep inside Remus, like the reopening of an old wound. His mouth went dry again, and he sipped his lukewarm tea. I hadn't thought, he said quietly. I hadn't forgotten, but he'd... he'd be twelve? Thirteen now. Thirteen. He shook his head slowly. Is he... what's he like? He looks like James, Dumbledore said sadly. But there is a good deal of Lily in him, too. Remus was quiet for almost a full moment before getting his breath under control. Finally, he raised his head. Okay, he said. 1st of September, 1993. You're going, then, Grant said. This was a redundant statement. Remus was literally packing his bags. He was getting the strangest sense of deja vu. How long it had been since he'd last packed a trunk for Hogwarts. He'd had to dig out all of his school robes, his weird wizard clothes. They were shabby and threadbare, but he wasn't willing to fork out for new stuff, so he did his best with some mending spells. Grant had painted Professor R. J. Lupin on his old briefcase as a joke, but it didn't feel very funny at that moment. I'm going, he confirmed, rolling up a pair of socks. Grant sat on the bed, watching him, stony-faced. Remus didn't blame him. He was being unspeakably cruel, he knew that. And Grant was putting up with it, yet again. 
Remus looked at him. It's a job. It's only for a year. At your old school? Yes, I've told you. I'm worried about you. I know you are. If Sirius has escaped and he knows you're there, will he? Can we not? I'm going and that's it. Remus snapped, clicking his suitcase shut fiercely. He didn't want to think about that. He just needed to get through today. They were silent for a bit then. Grant went and made tea, brought it back in. Remus stopped to sit and drink it with him. He'd given up smoking, for good this time, or so he told himself. Tea would have to do. You can still stay here, I'm not kicking you out, Remus said. This place is as much yours as it is mine, and there are protection spells, I made sure. Nah, Grant shrugged, giving a defeated smile. I'm rubbish on me own. Probably do the rounds or board at the Borstal. Been a while since I've seen the Brighton lot. Maybe I'll pop down. Stay in touch, okay? I'm not about to cart an owl round with me. Uh, I suppose not. I'll try to get to a phone if I can. God, you make it sound like you're off to war. Remus swallowed dryly and found he couldn't speak. Fortunately, Grant didn't have speaking in mind just then. He took Remus's tea from him, set it down on the bedside table, then turned around to push Remus down into the mattress. I'm gonna miss you, he smiled against Remus's lips, working the button on his trousers. Remus kissed him back as hard as they had when they were teenagers. Afterwards, Remus decided it was best to leave quickly. He wanted to think about Grant lying happy and flushed under the duvet, an enduring memory of youth and beauty. He dressed and picked up his bags. Just as he was about to say goodbye again, Grant grabbed his wrist. Oi! I love you, you tosser! Grant! Go on! Grant looked at him directly, his face just as honest and sunny as it had been at sixteen. Say it back! You know how I feel about you! Yeah! Grant smiled without a trace of bitterness. I do. But it'd be nice to hear it. Go on. Or no, you can. Terror gripped Remus's heart, but he swallowed it. He had to be brave. Grant deserved it. And he meant it. He did. He did. I love you. Cheers. Grant let go of his wrist, and that was all. We will see each other again, Remus said forcefully, promising it to himself as much as anything. Grant stretched out sleepily and nodded. Yeah, I know he sighed. Like magnets, you and me. Always snap back together again. Remus hurried out the door, not wanting to get too upset. He had a train to catch. Chapter 184 Summer 1994 For the first week or so after Remus returned from Hogwarts, he didn't know how to feel. For the first time in a very long time, Remus was lost, untethered, drifting. He wandered around the flat like a ghost, going through the movements of everyday life but feeling nothing. It wasn't depression. He knew what depression felt like. It's shock, said Grant. Oh, said Remus, staring blankly at the TV. Obviously, he'd expected Hogwarts to stir up old memories. He'd known from the start that revisiting the place could easily ruin him, but he'd done it anyway. Maybe he was a masochist. Maybe he was just stupid. The castle was filled with ghosts from Remus's past, which was a deeply unsettling experience after spending the better part of a decade trying to forget it all. The moment he'd arrived at King's Cross, it all came flooding back. The pokey little train carriages with the worn-out upholstery, the trolley witch, chocolate frogs, the bustle and noise of students embarking on a new term. But the full moon ahead of him, he'd squirreled away in a compartment and promptly fallen asleep until the carriage turned cold, and the Dementors... No. Anyway, ghosts. McGonagall was perhaps the strangest. She must have known he would be coming, but their first meeting had hit Remus harder than expected, and she'd seemed just as surprised as him. They weren't quite sure how to relate to each other now. Mr. Lupin! Oh, I'm sorry, Professor Lupin! Hello, Prof... I mean, uh... Minerva, please! She smiled gracefully. She reached out and squeezed his arm. She was every bit as formidable as she had been twenty years ago, only a little greyer at the temples. But then so was he. "'It's wonderful to see you, Remus,' she said earnestly. 
It's good to be back, he lied. Her eyes were soft and kind, as if she could see right through him. My office is always open, if you need anything, as ever. He appreciated the gesture, but didn't prevail upon her very often, largely because he wanted to keep to himself. He also wanted to stay away from Gryffindor Tower if he could. The rest of the school was familiar. The lush, expansive grounds, the secretive forest, the food, the portraits, the staircases he had mapped so carefully. But Gryffindor Tower, the most intimate and happy space of his adolescence, that would be almost too much to recover from. He was put in mind of Homer once again, the word nostalgia, which meant a painful homecoming. That was exactly how it felt. He didn't socialise much with his peers. The staff knew, by and large, about his lycanthropy, but he still preferred to avoid any unpleasant conversations if he could. Were they tutting behind his back? Were they wondering about him? No one's seen him for years. He was Black and Potter's closest friend. What does he know? What did he do? Funnily enough, Professor Binns had forgotten Remus, but at least Flitwick hadn't. He was very kind, inviting Remus to stop by the charms classroom for tea and toast a few times. Remus did to be polite, but found it difficult to forget all the times he and Sirius had locked themselves inside the kindly professor's classroom. He generally found it very hard to reconcile his adult self, responsible for lesson plans and marking essays and the welfare of students, with his reckless teenage self, wild and arrogant and madly in love. There were entire wings of the castle he actively avoided for this very reason. He barely left his classroom and chambers except for meals in the Great Hall, and he never went to Hogsmeade, except to quickly pass through on the way to the old phone box just outside the village, and thank God that was still there. "'How is it?' Grant asked the first time Remus called. "'Awful. Bearable. I suppose, like teaching, the kids are okay. Actually, the kids are great.' "'Well, just focus on that. First time I went into a Roman home after St. Edmund's, I thought I was going to have to quit. I swear those places all smell the same.' Anyway, you can get past it, if you remember it's about the kids, not you. Be the teacher you wish you had. This was good advice, and Remus did his very best. He hadn't had much experience with young people, but he very clearly remembered being a young person himself. He tried to organise lessons he would have found interesting, bring in magical creatures whenever he could, like Ferox had, and giving extra tips and pointers wherever students were struggling. Really, it wasn't too difficult from the study lessons he'd held back when he was in school. Equally, Remus tried to pay attention to all of his students and learn their characters, their individual needs. That was incredibly weird at first. He found no less than five Weasleys to teach, one in almost every year. Then there was poor little Neville Longbottom, awkward and nervous and twitchy. Narcissa's son was in another class, the spitting image of Lucius. And then, of course, there was... Anyway... Aside from Flitwick and McGonagall, the rest of the staff were virtual strangers to Remus, except, of course, for the potions master. Remus had really wanted to stay out of Snape's way, but from the very first day it was clear that that was not going to be easy. It was a full moon, and of course, Snape was the only one who knew how to brew Wolfsbane potion. The prick. He probably learned how to do it just to torment Remus. It was bad enough they had to share a castle again, but Snape was hell-bent on making sure Remus felt his displeasure at the arrangement. "'Lupin,' he said haughtily at their first meeting, just before the welcome feast. "'I was surprised to hear you'd survived the war,' his lips curled, "'when it seemed so many of your friends did not.' As foul as Snape was, it did bring out something Remus hadn't properly felt in years. Mischief. "'Severus,' he said warmly. And I was surprised to hear you survived the trials, when so many of your friends did not. Snape sneered, and that set the tone for the year. Severus had clearly not forgotten the events of their fifth year. He was as despicable as Remus remembered him, and had not aged well. His hair still hung lank and greasy, perhaps a little further back than before. His black eyes were more sunken, and his nose was more beak-like. He made Remus's skin crawl, but there was nothing to be done about it. They had to meet privately each month for the potion. The potion itself was utterly vile, and Remus resented it bitterly. It tasted awful, but worse than that was the effect it had. He still transformed, still suffered the agonies as his skull elongated and his back split open and his tendons creaked, but he fully retained his human mind afterwards. 
This was utterly horrible. Remus had come to see the monthly retreat into his animal brain as something of a catharsis, but having an animal body and human thoughts turned out to be very unpleasant indeed. He felt neither here nor there, trapped in the wrong form and unable to escape. He curled up to sleep, locked inside his office, every month full of self-loathing. In the mornings after, he would limp to Madame Pomfrey's office to ask for Mertlap essence. Of everyone from Remus's childhood, Pomfrey seemed the most pleased to see him again. She had aged like everyone else, but had retained her gentle touch, her sweet face, and her no-nonsense attitude to Remus's well-being. Remus! She reached up to hug him for the very first moment she saw him. Just look at you, giant of a man! Uh, madam, uh, Poppy. As polite as ever, she smiled. Come on, come and tell me what you've been doing with yourself. They had a few very pleasant catch-ups in her office by the fireplace. She wanted to know everything about his transformation since Hogwarts, and he told her as much as he could. She was interested to hear about the pack, and how they were able to heal each other by sharing group magic. I tried to get in touch with you after the Potters died, she said sadly, but no one would tell me where you were living, and I didn't dare ask too much in case. Remus looked away, embarrassed. I'm sorry, he said. I wanted to be left alone. Yes, well, you were the same as a boy. Stubborn, she smiled fondly. He smiled back, realising how much he'd missed her. For the first month or so, Remus's nerves were raw. He hesitated as he turned every corner, worried that he might be seeing something painful. But as pain often does, this lessened over time. He slipped into a new character. Not the teenage Remus who took risks without thinking, who was desperate to prove himself. And not the half-muggle, half-broken man he'd been in London. Somewhere between these two warring halves, he became Professor Lupin, restrained and serious, offering encouragement wherever he could. And this was all just as well, because that was exactly who he needed to be. For Harry. God. Harry. Harry Potter was James and Lily seamlessly combined, all charm and cheek and strength and goodness. Remus had been worried, knowing that the kid's childhood had been far from ideal, that Harry would be difficult. Remus well remembered his own spiky temperament at thirteen. Cruel adults make bitter children. But no. Harry was as kind-hearted and open-minded as his parents, full of love and so, so generous with it. Getting to know him had been painful and joyful all at once. The first time they met, Remus thought he was still dreaming. He woke up on the train, clawed awake by Dementors, those fucking abominations. He cleared the threat and stared around at the faces of the frightened kids, found Harry, passed out on the floor. Until he opened his eyes, he was James. Nothing could convince Remus otherwise. A bit skinnier, maybe shorter than Prongs had been at thirteen, but otherwise the spitting image. Of course, Harry had no idea who Remus was, and for as long as possible it stayed that way. How could he explain? Even after a few conversations with the boy, Remus was completely at sea. So he let Harry lead the way, and answered the questions which had suitable answers. When Harry came to him asking for Patronus lessons so that he could keep playing Quidditch, Remus couldn't say no. It was exactly what James would do, too. And when Sirius came up, he sidestepped it. Harry already knew that Black and James had been friends, and Remus wasn't sure what more he could say without losing the kid's trust. Yes, Harry, your dad was my best friend, but Sirius Black was my everything. No, it wouldn't do. What was more, Remus wasn't sure whether the Wizarding World had its own version of Section 28. If he started confessing stuff like that, could he get in trouble for corrupting young minds? It was bad enough he was a werewolf. By that time, it was already clear that Sirius was nearby. When the convict broke into the castle on Halloween night, Remus almost walked straight off the grounds and apparated back to London. Maybe he would have if the perimeter weren't swarming with the mentors, and of course the fact that Black was definitely after Harry. That made Remus furious. Hadn't Sirius done enough damage? He must have really lost his mind. He must have strayed so far from the young man who'd cradled baby Harry in his arms with tenderness and awe. Remus used this as a reminder to steal himself. It was no use mourning Sirius. His Sirius had died many years ago. And then that night happened. In a matter of hours, everything changed. Fuck. Maybe Grant was right. Maybe it was shock. After being given his marching orders from Hogwarts, 
Thank God, another year might have killed him. Remus took the night bus back to London, his mind churning over everything he'd learnt. Events kept shifting and reordering themselves. Some things became clearer, others muddied by various versions of the truth. The things Sirius had said, the excuses Wormtail had snivelled, and everything Remus thought he'd known. None of these accounts lined up quite right. The only thing Remus was certain of was that for twelve years he'd hated the wrong person. Please come back, he wailed down the phone to Grant once he was home. Please, please! I'm on my way, Grant said and hung up immediately. It still took hours. Remus changed into his muggle clothes, throwing Professor Lupin's shabby robes in a corner of the bathroom and paced the flat while he waited, cursing the slowness of muggle transport. He didn't drink. He wanted a clear head. He wanted to understand. Remus! Grant burst into the living room, tired and dishevelled. He'd had a haircut in the past year. It was so short it barely curled any more. Remus hated it but said nothing, just ran to hug him. What happened? Grant asked, huffing as Remus knocked the air out of him, but squeezing him back reassuringly. He didn't look the same, but he smelled the same, and that helped. That was grounding. He was innocent, Remus babbled, still clinging on. It was Peter all along. It was never him. I'm such an idiot. Remus, I don't know what you're talking about, please. Let's just sit down, shall we? Christ, you're skinny. Don't they feed you at that school? Remus allowed Grant to take over. He sat obediently on the couch, accepted a glass of water and a cigarette, because apparently Grant was smoking again, and the temptation was too much. The flat felt bare and stuffy, having sat empty for most of the year, and Grant opened the living room window, letting in the everyday sounds of foot traffic and pigeons. "'Okay,' Grant said, sitting opposite Remus, clasping his hands together in a very teacherly sort of way. "'Let's start at the beginning, shall we?' Remus nodded. He was determined to speak. If anyone could sort all of this out, it was Grant. He was sure of it. Sirius, he said. I saw Sirius and Peter. Wait, Grant frowned. Peter? I thought he... No, Remus said darkly, his insides turning with hot rage. He's alive. He's been hiding all these years. From Sirius? From everyone. He did it. He betrayed Lily and James. It was never serious. Ow! Grant shook his head, clearly confused. So he was in prison all this time for something that Peter did? Jesus. Okay. You're sure? He's the one who told you? Yes, but I... I know for sure. I saw Peter and I... Remus faltered. I just believe Sirius, okay? The fact was that he had read Sirius's mind, and he was still trying to get his head around that. He tried to piece the events of the night together for Grant's benefit and his own. It was all Harry, James's son. He left the school one night, and I knew why, so I followed him. I was worried Sirius would try to... But then Peter was there. I saw him, and I didn't know what to think. Something deep inside him had known it once, the second he saw Wormtail's name appear on the map but he'd had to find out, had to know for sure. And then he'd got to the shack, and there was Sirius, skin and bones and rags and madness, cackling on the floor, Harry standing over him, poised with his wand. The wolf part of Remus took over, recognising that Padfoot was in danger, and he disarmed everyone at once. Where is he, Sirius? Then he saw the rat, and it all fell into place. His mind went rushing back to 1981. All the secrecy, the mistrust, the lies. He looked at Sirius properly, he widened his eyes, and, almost without trying, he entered Sirius's thoughts. Show me, he commanded, using the same magic the werewolves used. Sirius's brain was half canine by that point, and maybe that's why it worked. Black resisted for a moment, no doubt recalling Walpurga's forced intrusions, but he nodded and let Remus in. But Padfoot, James's voice, echoing from a distant past, I thought we were agreed. I know, but this is better, can't you see? No one will ever suspect Wormy. Like a double bluff, Lily chimed in. It's brilliant. Remus didn't need to hear any more. He lowered the wands and helped Sirius up and embraced him tightly. I'm sorry, he communicated wordlessly. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 
Back in the flat, tears pricked in Remus's eyes and Grant pulled out a hanky, handing it to him. So is he free now, Sirius? No, Remus shook his head, collecting himself. It got complicated and I... It was a full moon. I only saw him for twenty minutes, maybe, and then I turned and... So much happened without me. Peter ran away. They didn't catch him. I should have killed him when I had the chance. I wanted to. I was going to, but... Harry stopped me. Grant paled, his mouth a grim line. He didn't say anything, though. By the time it was morning, Sirius had escaped again, too, Remus continued. He's in hiding, and I don't know... I don't know if I'll ever see him again. He wiped his eyes and ran his fingers through his hair. Fuck, all this time, all this time, and I believed it. How could I have been so stupid? Hey, stop it, Grant frowned, reaching out. Remus stood up abruptly, ignoring Grant and pacing the room once more, muttering to himself. I should have known he would have never hurt James. I shouldn't have been so bloody gullible, so weak. I should have tried to see him. I could have got him out of there. I could have tracked down Peter. I could have... Remus! Grant raised his voice. Stop it! Remus looked at him. I don't know what to do, he said. Grant sighed. Me neither, mate. He rubbed a hand over his face and Remus saw the rings under his eyes. Grant stood up. But there's nothing you can do right this second. So, I'm gonna have a shower, right? Then we'll get dinner. Then we'll talk a bit more. Remus nodded eagerly. Yes, this is what he needed. A plan. Clear to find next steps. Grant left the room warily. Remus waited, listening to the water running, trying once again to get his thoughts in order. He did something he hadn't done since he was a teenager. He made a list. So, Mooney, he said to himself, what are the facts? 1. Sirius Black did not murder James and Lily Potter. 2. Peter Pettigrew was alive. 3. Peter Pettigrew had been a spy. 4. Peter Pettigrew murdered James and Lily Potter. 5. Sirius Black had been in prison for twelve years for a crime he was innocent of. A surge of anger washed over him once more. He had believed it. He was as guilty as Dumbledore, as anyone else who had simply assumed Sirius was the spy because Sirius was a Black. In fact, Remus had been more at fault because he ought to have known. No one was closer to Sirius than he was. Those last few months of the war were such a blur. Hadn't there been something wrong? Hadn't Sirius been distant, cold with him? In the years past, Remus had taken that as proof of Padfoot's betrayal. But now, with a sick feeling, he saw it for what it was. He thought I was the spy, he said to Grant the second he was out of the bathroom. Oi, Grant frowned, trying to get past Remus, wrapped in a towel. Spy? What? Oh, let me get dressed, come on. Remus followed him into the bedroom and sat on the bed, talking fast as Grant dried himself and put on clean clothes. During the war, we knew there was a spy. We knew someone was passing information to the other side, but no one knew who it was. Afterwards, we thought it was serious. It all made sense. He was caught blowing up a street full of muggles and... Do you have to call normal people that? Sorry, anyway, Sirius was the secret keeper for James and Lily. Uh, that means he had this spell on him, so only he knew who they were to keep them safe. But he switched with Peter at last minute, and now we know that Peter was the spy... And they didn't tell me about the switch. Sirius didn't tell me because he must have... He didn't trust you, Grant said bluntly. Dressed, he sat down on the bed too, at a distance from Remus. I suppose I can't blame him. Have you broken his trust before? Grant raised an eyebrow. No. Did you think he was a spy before James and Lily died? No, never. Well then, Grant stood up. I'm going to nip down the shop. We need milk and bread, toothpaste. Wait, no, what do you mean, well then? Nothing. Look, come on, come to the shop with me. Then I'll promise we'll talk about it. I'll listen to you all night long if you want, I swear. I'll just need to get some food in you first. Remus went along with that. He watched Grant cook and he swallowed every mouthful. And then he talked and he talked and he talked. But it was no good. It came to nothing in the end. If Sirius is in hiding and Peter's on the run, Grant said, yawning. He'll go straight to Voldemort, the rat, Remus growled. 
Right then, Grant waved a hand. If Sirius is in hiding, then you can't do nothing. Sounds like it's out of your hands. Maybe I could send an owl. Only that might give away his location. And then you'll get arrested or sent to Alcatraz or whatever it is for colluding with a criminal, Grant said with an air of finality. I just want to help him, Remus said. Of course you do, but I don't see how. They sat in silence for a while, thinking. It was dark outside. Remus didn't know what time it was, but it had to be pretty late. Grant looked exhausted, and Remus felt a small twinge of guilt on top of everything else. Sorry to put you through all of this, he said quietly, reaching for Grant's hand. It's not really fair of me. It's fine. Grant gave him a small smile, stroking Remus's knuckles with his thumb. I do understand. It's just... a lot. I know. How... how was it, seeing him? I mean, how did it make you feel? Remus shifted awkwardly. There it was, the thought he'd been avoiding. Because if Sirius was innocent, if he'd never betrayed James, then he'd never betrayed Remus either. And Remus didn't know what that meant to him now, after so much time. We're both so different now, he said, aware Grant was holding his breath while he waited for the response. I barely recognised him, really. I just felt sorry for him. The flutter in his stomach told him he was lying. Grant moved over and kissed him. Everything will be all right in the end. Chapter 185 Early Summer, 1995 Saturday, 24th of June, 1995 that fucking phoenix arrived first, and Remus knew at once. What the bloody hell is that? Grant leapt up, startled by the silvery bird which burst into their living room. They'd been watching telly with all the windows open to counteract the summer heat. Remus had just been about to put the kettle on. The bird sapped on top of their boxy little TV and opened its beak, speaking in Dumbledore's voice. Hadfoot is on his way. Remus nearly dropped the empty mugs he was holding. Fuck. What? Grant said, watching the bird vanish into thin air. Who's Padfoot? Fuck, Remus said again, setting down the mugs. He'd begun to shake uncontrollably. He felt cold all over. I don't think I can. I don't think I can, he mumbled to himself, covering his mouth. Remus? Grant stood up and touched his shoulder. You're scaring me. Serious, he spluttered. Serious is Padfoot. Bloody hell, the murderer. Not a murderer, I told you. Right, right, uh, so, sorry, coming here. It's his flat, after all. Oh, I forgot, Grant said flatly. He bit his lip. Should I go? No, Remus clung to Grant suddenly. No, please, please don't. I can't be alone. Don't leave me alone with... Okay, okay, Grant soothed him, hugging him back. Calm down, all right. I won't go anywhere if you don't want. Just, just try to get yourself back together. I'm sorry. Remus took a deep breath. He knew he was acting childishly. This was no time to fall apart. He'd had years and years of that. If Dumbledore was sending Sirius to him, then something had happened. Something important. Now was the time for strength and action. He gazed about blindly for something to do. This place is a mess. I should start cleaning. He won't be long. Grant was helpless to do anything but watch as Remus ran round the flat like a headless chicken, using every cleaning charm he could remember, combined with some actual manual labour when he smucked up the spells. He couldn't stop moving, he couldn't bear to sit still for a moment, because then he might have to think. Within the hour there was a scratching noise at the door, and a low, gruff bark. Remus froze. A scent he'd not known in many years reared something in his subconscious. Was that a dog? Grant said nervously from the kitchen. You know I hate dogs. It's him, Remus breathed. He walked shakily to the door and pulled it open. There was Padfoot. Scrawny, mangy, fur slightly greying in places. But it was him. Come in, Remus said hoarsely. The dog huffed, bobbing its head and entered. Remus clicked the door shut and leaned against it, watching as Sirius transformed back into himself. Scrawny mangy, greying in places. His eyes, those dark blue eyes that had broken Remus's heart a thousand times as a teenager, 
had turned dull gunmetal grey. He was a bag of bones, unsettled all over. It was to be expected. I've come straight from Hogwarts, he said. His voice was as hard and rasping as it had been last summer. Yes, Remus rubbed the back of his head. Dumbledore sent a message ahead. Sirius twitched slightly and nodded. Something happened at the tournament. Harry was kidnapped. What? I is he your... He came back. He's fine. Fine as can be expected. Voldemort's back too. What? It's true. Harry faced him. No. Remus felt sick. The order's reforming. Dumbledore told me to come here. Lie low. Right, Remus nodded, still taking in the shock. If that's... Sirius's face softened. He looked younger, more like the real Sirius. If you don't mind, I just followed orders without thinking, but I could go somewhere else if... No, Remus said very firmly, snapping out of the confusion that had gripped him ever since Dumbledore's Patronus had appeared. He put a hand on Sirius's shoulder. Oh, he was so thin. Of course you can stay here. It's your home. Sirius looked so relieved that Remus wanted to pull him close and wrap his arms round him, but he didn't. He looked at Grant, who was watching warily from the kitchen doorway. Sirius followed his eyeline and gave a start. You're here. It wasn't a question, just a statement of fact. Grant, God love him, gave his breezy a smile. All right, mate. Tell you what, you look like you could do with a Chinese. I'll pop out, shall I, Remus? You don't have to. I think I do, Grant smiled. He grabbed his wallet from the coffee table on his way out. He didn't kiss Remus on the cheek as he usually might, but gave him a pat on the shoulder and said, I'll be half an hour. He closed the door softly behind himself. Sirius and Remus stood in silence for what felt like minutes. Sirius frowned, making deeper lines appear in his face. That was rude of me. I didn't mean to be rude. He began to scratch the back of his hand, anxiously, his fingernails long and black with grime. Remus felt a sorrowful tug deep in his stomach and reached out to still him. How about a shower, then a sit-down? Everything's okay. Sirius looked up at him. Remus had forgotten how much smaller he was. Sounds good, Sirius nodded weakly. Remus showed him into the bathroom, which was silly, because obviously he knew where the bathroom was. Nothing had changed in thirteen years. While Sirius was washing, Remus went to the bedroom to find some clean clothes. He pulled a few shirts out of the drawer. He wanted to give Sirius his things to wear, not Grant's, because after all this time, Remus didn't honestly know which belonged to who. He settled on an oversized knitted jumper, which was definitely his. It was swamp Sirius, but it would be comfortable. Digging out a pair of tartan pyjama bottoms to go with it, he lay them carefully on the bed. There was only one bed in the flat. There had only ever been one bed, and they had only ever needed one bed. The problem of where to put Sirius was unanswerable. Remus was still staring down at the clothes when he heard the water go off. The boiler stuttered and clunked a few times. He'd been meaning to look at it for ages. And the bathroom door click unlocked. Remus? Sirius called out, a note of panic in his voice. Bedroom, Remus replied. Sirius entered, his hair dripping on the carpet. He'd wrapped the biggest bath sheet round himself like a shawl, covering his whole body from neck to skinny ankles. Remus looked away, embarrassed, and gestured at the clothes laid out. Here, I'll let you change. He made to leave, but Sirius's hand darted out and grabbed his arm. He had that wild look in his eye again. Don't go, he said. Could you stay in the room? Okay. Remus nodded, patting Sirius's claw-like hand. He'd been scratching at it again. It was red raw. Remus turned and looked at the curtains while Sirius dressed himself. His movement sounded slow, like an old man or an invalid, not like elegant, energetic Sirius Black. Fury seared through Remus. They took everything from him, he thought fiercely. Everything that made him who he was. When he turned round, Sirius was sitting at the bed, Remus looked too, trying to see it through Sirius's eyes. The neatly made bedspread, the matching bedside tables, one with a book on top, the other with a packet of cigarettes. I'll sleep on the couch, Sirius said. I don't want to muck up anything between you and, um, sorry his name's gone. Grant. Grant, 
Sirius looked away again. His eyes never rested long. He was always searching the corners of the room for something. I've forgotten a lot, I think. That's okay. Remus had never felt a pain like this, and Remus had been feeling pain most of his life. Come and sit down. Cup of tea? Cup of tea, Sirius parroted back. Remus nodded slowly, then led him into the kitchen. Thank you, Sirius said after a little while. Sorry, I... I keep forgetting things. Remus touched his arm gently. It's okay, go and sit. I'll be a minute, you can hear me from the living room. Sirius left silently. Remus breathed a sigh of relief. The atmosphere was still thick with memory and hurt and Azkaban, but at least it was bearable when Sirius wasn't standing right there. Last year in the shack, Remus hadn't had time to feel anything other than terror and joy, and typically he'd spent the rest of his time since trying to pretend none of it had happened at all. Not because he wanted to, but because it was the only thing he could do. He should have known better. He should have known that Sirius always demanded confrontation. He took a long time over the tea, brewing it in a pot, rather than the electric kettle. How did Sirius take his tea? He couldn't remember. Maybe he'd never known. Sirius usually made it back then. In the end, Remus simply put out everything, setting up a tray with immaculate attention and care, as if he was serving the queen. Slice of lemon, little jug of milk, bowl of brown sugar lumps. There weren't any biscuits left. Grant had had the last of the digestives. When it was all ready, he still hadn't had the nerve to carry it through. He panicked for a moment before hearing the door click open. Had it been a half hour already? All right! Grant's brash, over-loud Cockney accent filled the flat, warming it instantly. He acted as if it were nothing out of the ordinary as he bustled into the living room, laden with food. Remus could hear him setting it all out on the coffee table, unwrapping cartons of egg-fried rice, sweet-and-sour chicken, chow mein, pork balls, Chinese ribs, spring rolls, all the while chatting away to Sirius. Blimey, don't you look better after a wash, eh? Still got that nice sick air. Jealous. I'll be bald by the time I'm forty, I reckon. See how grey Remus is? Looks distinguished, I tell him, but he don't listen. Fortified, Remus lifted the tray and carried it into the living room. Sirius was sitting primly on the edge of the couch, staring at Grant the way an animal stares at a potential predator. Or grab plates, Grant said, passing Remus on his way back to the kitchen. He didn't make eye contact. Remus didn't blame him. The situation wasn't fair on anyone, least of all Grant. Remus tried to smile at Sirius offering the tea tray. Here we are, he murmured. Sirius looked at the tea, the lemon, the sugar, then down at his hands. Are you hungry? Remus asked. Is this all right? Sirius nodded. Lovely, thanks. You shouldn't go through all this trouble. Nonsense. Grant brought in the plates. They sat round the coffee table, Sirius on the sofa, Remus in the armchair, and Grant on the floor. Sirius put food on his plate and picked at it like a bird. He didn't use the forks they'd put out or the chopsticks that came with the meal. He used his hands to eat, tearing everything into small pieces and feeding them into his mouth. Remus and Grant politely ignored it, making light conversation. I'll have to do a proper shop on my way back from work tomorrow, Grant said. Get you a toothbrush, some things like that. I can do that, Remus said. He was keen to take care of Sirius himself, as if he'd brought home a stray he ought to be responsible for. He looked at Sirius. Your clothes and books are boxed up in the garage. I'll go and have a look tomorrow. You kept them? Sirius looked up, almost hopefully. You kept my things? Er, uh, well, after everything, Mary showed up and did it for me. I wasn't... I wasn't very well for a while. I'm not sure what state they're in. I haven't been there since. I didn't expect you to keep anything. Remus didn't know what to say, so he shrugged. It hadn't really been a case of wanting to hang on to Sirius's stuff, more that he'd just hidden away so he didn't have to think about it. He was glad now, obviously, but he didn't want any more credit than he was due. They finished eating and Sirius wiped his greasy hands on the legs of his pyjama bottoms, and Remus tried not to wince. Sirius used to be so fastidious about cleanliness, Remus's disorganisation had always irritated him. Another change. Grant got up to collect the plates and cutlery for washing up. Sirius sat up. I can do that, let me. 
he withdrew a wand from his baggy sleeve. Where'd you get that? Remus asked, frowning. Stole it, Sirius looked down, turning it in his hand. Took a while to get used to, but I think I can handle it okay now. Here, let me. It's fine, Grant said. He was smiling, but you couldn't hear it in his voice. I prefer to do it normally. He turned, carrying the pile of plates into the kitchen. Muffly Arto, Sirius muttered. Remus blinked, surprised. He hadn't heard that spell in a very long time, and he'd never ever used something like that with Grant present. It felt disloyal, sneaky. Is the flu connection working? Sirius asked urgently. No, Remus said. I never reconnected. I don't actually do magic very much at home, because... Yeah, because of the muggle, Sirius finished, and Remus could have sworn he rolled his eyes. He's made a lot of changes, I see. He gave the TV a very pointed look. It's his home, too, Remus said defensively. Whatever, I don't care. Right, we'll need to reconnect it. If I'm staying here, that is. We'll need to be able to communicate with the rest of the Order. The rest of the... Have you got an owl? Sirius glanced around. No, Remus said. He chewed his lip. I've got a phone, he offered, trying to lighten the mood. For man and sake, Mooney! Sirius barked, his rough voice crackling with urgency. What have you been doing all these years, moping about? Remus flinched, both at being called Mooney, which no one ever did, and at the cruel accusation. I've been surviving, he said, trying to stay calm. How easy do you think it is for me to hold down a job? And it's not as I've had anyone I need to keep in touch with. Sirius didn't say anything, but pursed his lips and scowled, looking at the carpet. Remus sighed, closing his eyes. Look, he said gently, I can imagine how you must feel. I know you want to do everything at once now you're free, but let's just take things slowly tonight, okay? Get a proper night's sleep, and we'll work on a plan tomorrow. Sirius nodded, mollified. Remus felt proud of himself. He hadn't cried or shouted, and that was pretty good progress as far as Sirius Black was concerned. Grant re-entered the room, and Remus quickly undid the Muffliato charm. "'Shall I stick the telly on, then?' he asked the silent room. Remus nodded. Sirius returned to scowling. The news was on, and then the weather. Then some American hospital drama, which made Grant tut and switch over. There was a documentary on about Fleetwood Mac, which they all vaguely watched. No one really spoke, except Grant now and then. Remus was in turmoil, his brain whirring into overdrive as too many conflicting thoughts and feelings flashed past. It had been so long since he'd been in the same room as Sirius, and now they couldn't even talk to each other without hitting some immeasurable barrier, whether it was the war or lost friends or their mutual betrayal. And now the order was reforming, and it looked like everyone expected Remus to sign himself up once again, without hesitation. But he wasn't the boy he'd been last time. He was old, and he was tired. He had other responsibilities. He had Grant. At about ten o'clock, Sirius yawned. Yeah, me too, Grant commented, yawning back. Got work in the morning. Maybe it's time for bed. He looked at Remus, obviously hoping for some sort of direction. Yes, Remus said uncertain. He placed his hands on the arm of his chair to push himself up, stiff from sitting so rigidly all evening. Sirius, are you okay? I'll get you a cushion and a duvet. No need, Sirius said. He stretched again and transformed into Padfoot. Grant breathed in sharply at the surprise, but said nothing. The big black dog curled up on the couch and closed its eyes. Can you do that? Grant whispered half an hour later, once he and Remus were both in bed. Turn into a wolf whenever you like. No, Remus said. He's an animagus. He learned how to do it. I'm a werewolf. I got bitten. I don't get a choice. Bad luck, Grant said. Mind you, don't think I'd like it much if you could. He won't hurt you. He's still got his normal mind when he's a dog. Though Remus wasn't sure what Sirius's normal mind was like any more. Everything else about him was rumpled and damaged in some way. Are you okay? Grant said, turning his head to watch Remus's face. I think so, Remus said. But it's weird. It's going to be difficult, I think. How long will he be here? Oh, I don't know. A while, maybe. He's talking about another war. I might need to help. Remus? 
I know, I know. Remus screwed up his face. I'm sorry, the whole situation is... It's a fucking nightmare, really. I need some time to think. I wish I could help, Grant said. I wish I understood. You're so good with Sirius, Remus offered. I don't know what to say to him. He's so... I don't know, prickly. I'm scared I'll say something wrong and he'll bite my head off. Hmm. Well, I have a bit of experience with those types, Grant said, lips curling. Anyway, he's obviously been through the mill. Just gotta be patient. Kind. You can't force him to get better, I'm afraid. Sirius slept for a long time, long after Grant had left for work and Remus had eaten breakfast and marked a few exam papers. He stayed in the kitchen, but he could see the living room couch through the door, just in case. It was almost half past eleven when Padfoot jerked awake and began barking loudly, leaping off the couch. Remus ran into the living room anxiously. Sirius, it's me! You're here with me! The dog stopped, cocked its head, then transformed back into Sirius. His eyes were wide and his jaw shadowy from stubble. He looked like a mad person. Remus tried to be patient and kind, like Grant said. Sorry, he said, steadying his voice. It's just we're not allowed pets here, and if the neighbours hear you... Sorry, Sirius looked down, embarrassed. You'd think I'd be used to it now. Been out a year. He's fine, Remus shook his head. I'm sorry I shouted. Things stayed awkward like that for most of the day. They went out to the garage after Sirius had eaten breakfast. The door took a few goes to heave open, and Sirius had to stay in dog form while they were out of the flat, so it all fell to Remus. Still, they got in eventually, and everything was very much as they remembered. No motorbike, of course, though all the tools were still there. Sirius's clothes and books were neatly stacked in labelled boxes, without so much as a layer of dust on them. Mary must have done some sort of preserving spell, Remus commented. Sirius nodded vaguely, walking through the piles of relics like an ancient monk. He selected a few things to take back to the flat, or rather for Remus to carry back. Sirius chose robes and wizard's clothes, none of his muggle stuff, not even his old leather jacket, which Remus found stuffed inside a box under some records. He had to resist the urge to bury his face in it and inhale the gorgeous scent, as if the jacket had more of Sirius in it than the man standing next to him. Back at the flat, Sirius changed into the robes at once. Remus could see why. He looked much better already in his own things, having had a few good meals and a proper wash. His hair was a bit scraggly and still had knots in it, despite the fact that he'd clearly used half a bottle of shampoo on it. He slept again after lunch. Remus didn't see how, he'd only been awake for a few hours. Still, despite Sirius's inability to stay still, he exhausted easily. He curled up on the couch again in the nest of blankets he created, and Remus sat down with him with the TV on very low. At least when Sirius slept, he was a dog, and therefore easier to share a room with. He was grumpy when he woke up. He squinted at the TV, then at Remus. Don't you read any more? Of course I do, Remus gestured at the bookcases either side of the fireplace, which were sagging under the weight. TV's just background noise. Sirius grunted, sitting up and straightening his clothes. He ran his fingers through his hair and they got caught. He winced. You want to try washing it again? Remus asked. If you put loads of conditioner on, then comb it through, that might help. He remembered Grant telling him that about two brothers who'd come into the remand centre. They'd been neglected and had never had their hair cut or brushed, and they were frightened of the clippers. Grant remembered Matron's brutal buzz cuts, and he immediately promised them he wouldn't cut their hair. He'd spent hours gently combing it through instead, and his hands were wet and cold for so long his eczema flared up and his palms were rough and chapped for weeks. Sirius seemed to appreciate the suggestion, so Remus went to run the bath. Sirius followed him. He didn't want to be left alone at all, even if he didn't want to talk. Remus rooted around in the medicine cabinet for a good strong comb and some scissors, just in case. He set them on the edge of the bathtub and stepped back. Uh, shall I leave you to it? he asked as the bath water steamed gently. Sirius rubbed his arm, looking around. No, I think I'd rather... If you don't mind. Anything you like, Remus said. Let him lead the way, Grant had suggested. Go with the flow. He thought about turning round as Sirius undressed, but that seemed redundant, if he was staying in the room. And anyway, Sirius had no scruples about stripping off in front of him. 
There was nothing sensual about it. He did it in the same way he now ate with his hands, or wiped his mouth with his sleeve, or curled up tightly on the sofa. He did it because he'd forgotten to act around other people. He was so thin, so frail, his elbows jutted out like knives, and his hollow ribs moved under his paper-white skin. His once warm, slender wrists, which Remus had adored, were now so narrow they'd look like they'd snap if he lowered himself into the bath. Remus pretended to be tidying up the bathroom, and started folding up the flannel hanging off the side of the sink, straightening the towel slung over the radiator. He was embarrassed. He didn't want to stare. Though, to be honest, Sirius probably wouldn't notice either way. Eventually, Remus sat on the closed toilet lid, crossing his legs in an effort to look nonchalant, and because the bathroom was much too small for his annoying, gangly body. Sirius leaned back into the hot water, making small, slow waves slop gently against the plastic sides of the tub. He closed his eyes and tilted his head back into the water, exposing his throat, his Adam's apple protruding. Remus had to remember to close his mouth as Sirius resurfaced, opening his eyes as sweeping his hair back. Now it was wet, the grey had vanished, and he became suddenly younger, more recognisable. He started lathering his hair with the shampoo, sitting up, leaning forward. Remus watched his bony white fingers clawing through the foam, and remembered how graceful Sirius had been as a young man, how every moment was perfectly weighted, how he used to treat his own body with such tenderness. The steam from the hot water stung Remus's eyes, and he had to blink away tears. Sirius rinsed out the shampoo, then started on the conditioner, using loads of it. Remus would have to buy more. We ought to make a list, Sirius said abruptly. What? A list, Sirius said, picking up the comb. We ought to make one. People to get in contact with. For Dumbledore. For Dumbledore, Remus repeated. He suddenly felt very tired. Yeah, he said get in touch with the old crowd. Only my memory's shot, so you'll have to help. The names, you know. He tugged the comb through his knots hard. You really want to go right back to war, don't you? Remus said. Sirius turned and gave him a look of disbelief, and with a horrible sinking feeling, Remus realised that in Sirius's mind, the war had never ended. Look, Remus tried to explain. It's not that I don't believe in the cause, it's just... I remember how it went last time. As if I don't... Sirius hissed, yanking at the comb in his hair. I haven't been on holiday for twelve years. No, I know, but... Remus wished he'd stop saying it like that. Twelve years. What forgiveness could there ever be for that? It's all we can do, Sirius said fiercely. It's the only thing that matters. He raised the comb again, looking as though he were about to stab himself with it rather than groom himself. Remus couldn't stand it. Stop it! he said, getting up. You'll rip all your bloody hair out, come on. Let me do it. He rolled up a towel and put it on the floor to kneel on, grabbing the comb out of Sirius's hand. Sirius looked at him warily for a moment, and Remus realised that they had not been this close yet. They had hugged in the shack a year ago, but that had been pure adrenaline. It had not been intimate. This was. May I? Remus asked, softening his voice. Sirius nodded slowly, then turned his head so that Remus could reach. Leaning in, not too much, Remus began to work, sliding his fingers carefully through the slick black locks, gently easing the comb through in sections from the bottom up. Slowly, slowly, the knots began to loosen, giving way to that familiar old silken texture. It was difficult work and took a lot of patience, and the rest of the bottle of conditioner, but Remus finally felt like he was helping. He was in control, and he was doing something positive. Sirius was so quiet and still the whole time, tense at first, but gradually relaxing, bit by bit. Remus could practically see his tendons slackening. Once he was finished, Remus leaned back to survey his work. The muscles in his back ached like they were on fire, but it was worth it. He stood up shakily, a hand on the sink. Sirius raised his hands, moved them gingerly over his head, fingers skimming the smooth surface. Thanks. Any time, Remus smiled, sitting back on the loo seat. Sirius rinsed his hair a few more times, then climbed out and dried himself, getting dressed again. Remus expected him to look at himself in the mirror, but he didn't. He purposefully avoided it, keeping his eyes down. Back in the living room, Remus made them tea and some cheese on toast, because he wanted Sirius to eat as often as possible. He expected Sirius to fall asleep again, but he didn't. 
He took some paper from Remus's pile of exams and flipped it over, picking up a bureau, too. Okay, he said. Moody, obviously top of the list, after he's recovered, of course. Wait till you hear what happened to him at Hogwarts. Then there's the Weasleys and Mary. No, not Mary, Remus said. She won't. She's settled down now. She's got kids. And the Weasleys, they've got seven kids, Sirius. You can't ask that of people. I don't need to, Sirius said sharply. They'll do what's right. I can't see it that way, Remus said. All I can see is the cost of another war. We don't have a choice. I know, I know. I just want us to think before we... What's happened to you, Remus? This isn't like you. You're supposed to be a Gryffindor. That struck a nerve. How dare he? Quite a bit has happened to me, actually, Remus said acidly. I lost everyone I ever cared about in the last war, so forgive me if I'm not thrilled about marching straight to battle again. I'm not twenty-one any more. Sirius shook his head, still unable to comprehend. We owe it to them, to Lily and James. I don't owe them anything, Remus shouted, his face burning with anger. Maybe you feel like you do, secret keeper, but if you recall, I wasn't fucking consulted on that one. He didn't know why he said it. It all just came tumbling out before he could stop himself. He hadn't realised how angry he really was until that moment. Clearly Sirius hadn't either. Mooney! Don't you dare call me Mooney! Don't act like we're still... like nothing's changed, like everything's fine, and I'm just going to do everything you say! He stood up. He needed to get out. He needed a break. He turned on his heel, heading for the door. No, Remus, please! Sirius cried out, his voice so taut and strangled it frightened Remus. He turned back. Sirius stared up at him from the couch, so small and wide-eyed. "'Please don't leave me alone,' he said. Remus relented, his temper draining away to nothing. He returned to his armchair and sat down again. He pursed his lips. He rubbed his eyes. "'I won't,' he said wearily. "'I'm not going anywhere.'" Chapter 186 Summer 1995. Grant. Mr. Chapman, we are very pleased to extend the following offer of employment to you on behalf of Brighton and Hove City Council. Social worker, child and youth welfare. Please see the attached brochure for details on your salary and working hours. You have 30 working days to respond to this offer by either post or telephone. We look forward to hearing from you. A.P. Green, Head of Social Services. Brighton and Hove. Grant read the letter three times just to make sure. Well, he really ought to be happy, thrilled. This was amazing news, news worth celebrating. It was one way out of the mess he currently found himself in, anyway. He shook his head, feeling terrible for thinking of Remus's life a mess, even if that was a little bit true. He'd gone down for the interview a few weeks ago, telling Remus he was working late. Not that he wanted to hide anything from Remus, more like he just didn't want to jinx things. Grant wasn't a very lucky person, generally. Stuff like this never, ever happened to him. Grant didn't believe in God, or guardian angels, or Buddha, or Brahmin, or anything other than his own willpower. But something about this job offer smacked of divine intervention. This was his dream job, after all. Perhaps this is the sign he was waiting for as if old ex-boyfriends returning from prison wasn't enough of an omen. He'd been toying with the idea of moving for years. Grant loved London, it would always be in his blood, but they were both in their mid-thirties now, and maybe it was time for a change. He wanted Remus to get out to the countryside, to fresh air and sea and space, a fresh start away from that miserable little flat. So when the position came up and Grant's manager mentioned it to him, he leapt at the chance. Of course, that was all before Sirius came back. Grant reread the letter again from the top. He stared at his name, in official black and white printed text. A letter with my name on it, and it's not even a court summons, he joked to himself. He wished he could show his dickhead grandfather, show him what Nancy boy delinquents can amount to when they put their minds to it. He was proud of himself, and no matter what the situation was right now, he knew Remus would be proud of him too. 
He wished he could tell him straight away, but Remus was out, and Grant was hiding in the bedroom from Sirius. Grant was supposed to be keeping an eye on him. He'd promised, but as soon as Remus was out the door, Sirius said something nasty about not needing a nursemaid, bloody hell how posh was he, and turned into a dog again. It was so painfully obvious that Black hated Grant's guts, so hiding out in the bedroom felt like the best solution. He'd have to wait for Remus to get home then, to break the news. He hoped it wouldn't be too long, but he had no idea really. Remus had gone to some sort of meeting and hadn't given Grant any details. He talked to Sirius about it, though, at length. They muttered together in the living room, thinking Grant wouldn't notice. The pitch of their whispering swung wildly to and fro. One moment angry staccato hissing, the next soothing low apologies. Their body language was the same. Grant learned quickly that the important stuff between Sirius and Remus was the stuff neither of them said out loud. It was all in looks, gestures, tilted heads and raised eyebrows. Impossible for an insider to keep up with. And Grant felt very much the outsider. He'd never known two people who could be simultaneously so angry with each other and so much in love. And it was love, without a doubt. Grant got a sick feeling in his stomach. He'd been ignoring it for days. Remus had been different for a while, but until that bloody black dog showed up, Grant had thought there might be hope for recovery. A bit more time, a bit more space, some distance from all that darkness. Grant would pull Remus back from the edge. He'd done it before. He could do it again. But now it looked impossible. Remus did not want things back the way they were. He hadn't said it. Maybe he didn't know it. But it was very obvious to Grant. Look, okay, Grant knew he was not the brightest bulb in the box. Not as clever as Remus, anyway. Probably not as clever as Sirius. That had never bothered him much, because, after all, he couldn't be anyone but himself, and he had plenty else going for him. He worked hard, and he cared about people, and people cared about him, and those things were ingredients for a very happy life, in Grant's opinion. So he wasn't a genius, but he did know some things. He liked to think that, at the very least... He knew when it was time to make a graceful exit. Grant loved Remus very much. He probably loved him ever since that first day, twenty years ago, when the lanky, exhausted, skittish teenager had loped into the dorm room at St. Edmund's. He was so quiet and so closed up, even though there was clearly a universe inside of him. Remus was never the same person twice. He was jaded and world-weary one moment, naive and blushing the next. He was bubbling with rage and love at the same time, and most of the time he let love win. Grant liked to think he'd had a bit of a hand in that, especially over the last few years. Grant had worked hard to keep the softest parts of Remus safe, and he had. He'd done a good job. He'd taken care of him, until Remus really didn't need taken care of any more. It was perhaps time to let go. He still didn't want to just hand him back like a borrowed book. Grant had said goodbye to plenty of people over the course of his short yet colourful life, and not one of them had meant a thing, until Remus. Grant knew how pathetic that sounded. Nearing thirty-six and only one real relationship, only one true friendship. Whatever happened, they would stay friends, there was no question of that. But Grant knew he had to be practical, and he had to look after himself for once. Remus had always belonged to another world, that was partly what made him so attractive. The time had come for Remus to go back where he belonged, and though Grant knew that for a while the absence would hurt, it was completely necessary. It reminded him of that Suzanne Vega song. Grant was never one for reading too much into lyrics, not like Remus. He didn't have a poetic soul. But when the Solitude Standing album came out, and it had been all over the radio, and Grant quite liked it. He always meant to buy the album, but never got around to it. She had a haunting voice, and this one particular tune was ghostly and strange. Then Remus had told him what it was about, and he hated it. He didn't usually like fairy tales. Having recognised his sexuality at the age of six, the idea of brave knights rescuing damsels in distress had never inspired him much. But something about Calypso really struck a nerve. He knew he wasn't a siren, sitting on the rocks jiggling his tits at passing sailors, but he knew Remus. He knew Remus inside and out. He'd seen the change in him since Sirius came back. At first, Remus had clung to Grant as his protector, which made sense. A bit of regression was probably to be expected, 
and Grant had always done his best to be solid ground for Remus. But after the stress of the first few days had passed, Remus and Sirius had both relaxed a little bit, and everything was different. So different that it was shocking. Grant hadn't really known what their relationship was like when they were young, but he caught glimpses of it now. The way Remus stared at Sirius, as if he was the most gorgeous creature on earth, the heat in his eyes, the way his tongue played at the corner of his mouth like he was daydreaming something utterly filthy. Remus had never looked at Grant like that. Not really. And Sirius lit up when Remus spoke to him. Yes, they were obviously still in love, and it was not the same kind of love that Grant and Remus had. He didn't know if it was better or not, but he could practically feel the conflict tearing Remus apart. He didn't want to tear Remus apart. He never had. He still wanted to keep him safe. And there was Sirius himself, prim and poisonous, lurking like a spider all the time, glaring daggers whenever Grant entered the room. He made his feelings perfectly clear, and it made Grant indignant, made him want to fight all the harder to keep Remus. But it wasn't up to Grant any more. Remus was going somewhere Grant couldn't follow him. They'd reached a crossroads, and it was all very clear. Maybe the letter really was an omen. He conjured up the image he'd been toying with, of him and Remus in a house by the sea, reading books and eating breakfast in bed and going for walks into town, getting older, making new friends. If they had a big enough house, they could begin fostering. Grant had been interested in doing that for years. He wanted to take care of kids no one else wanted, and if he was going to be a social worker, then he'd be a perfect candidate. He let the fantasy wash over him one last time, and then he began to dismantle it because deep down Grant knew that Remus would never have left London anyway, and Remus would never want to foster children. He'd be too afraid he'd hurt them on a full moon. That future had always been a bit of wishful thinking. It was more about Grant than Remus. It was time to stop worrying about Remus and what Remus needed. That wasn't his responsibility any more. Perhaps there would be someone else for Grant. He hoped so. He would never stop looking. Perhaps someone would want to keep him safe for a change. Stranger things happened at sea. The decision was made. Grant wrote a formal response accepting the job offer. He'd post it on his way out. He began to pack quietly, hoping that Remus wouldn't come home until he was finished. There was so much to do, but at the same time, not a lot. Grant found himself surprised by just how easily the plan came together. He had his own bank account, and he didn't have any stake in the flat. He could stay at his aunt's pub down in Hove until he found his own place to live. He even had friends in Brighton from where he'd lived as a kid. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. So once he'd packed, he'd just need to say goodbye. He hoped he could say it the right way, it not sound bitter or self-pitying. He hoped Remus would understand that Grant would always be there if he needed him. He'd come running in a heartbeat. At the same time, he hoped that Remus would not need him. He hoped that he was leaving him in safe hands. Finished packing, Grant sent on the bed. He could hear the TV in the other room, up a bit too loud. Sirius left it on all night sometimes, and it woke Grant up. But if he went to turn it off, that hideous black dog would wake up and start growling at him in the dark. Probably a trauma thing. Grant didn't blame Sirius, but he wished he didn't have to manifest like that. Could he really trust a man like that to take care of anyone? Grant's heart ached as he imagined Remus, sweet, serious, sensitive Remus, being treated like a mental punching bag. He would just put up with it, Grant could tell. Remus felt so guilty about Sirius's imprisonment that he was willing to take all sorts of abuse for it. But that wasn't right. Grant stood up. He had to do one more thing then before he could leave. He had to talk to Sirius. Chapter 187 Summer, 1995 Sirius Sirius sat curled up on the couch, his arms round his legs. He was watching television. It was a bizarre muggle invention, a bit like the cinemas he'd been to in his youth, only smaller. Oh no, oh no, that brought back a memory of James. That summer they'd gone to see the same film every day and met those muggle girls. Had it been summer or Christmas? It might have been raining and someone punched him. James or Remus? Surely Remus. James was never violent, even when Sirius really deserved it. 
Syria shut his eyes to drown out the cold, cruel voices in his head which wanted to drag him back through time, back to the very worst moments. He thought he could taste blood, but when he opened his eyes again, all he saw was the living room and the silly talking muggle box. It was his living room, or it had been once. It looked different, and Sirius had a hard time working out whether it was different or he was just remembering wrong. The walls hadn't been repainted, the fireplace was there. It didn't stink of cigarette ash any more, but there was still a burn mark in the carpet under the window sill. Had that been there before, or it had happened in the years between? The TV was the worst change, the most noticeable. Sirius had a strong memory of arguing against having one a long time ago. Noisy, ugly, muggle light boxes. He still thought it was awful, but somehow he couldn't bring himself to stop watching him. It distracted him. It was a break from thinking, from remembering. He'd spent too much of his life remembering, turning over events, over mistakes and half-understood conversations, sifting through it all again and again, until everything in his head was shaken loose in tiny fragments, no structure or narrative. He didn't want to sit and think any more. He wanted to act. He wanted to do and no one would let him. He huffed, shifting position, tightening his grip on the arm of the couch. Remus had been invited to a meeting, and Sirius had been told to stay at home with the muggle. It would have been fine if he'd gone as Padfoot. He knew it would have, but no one would listen. They were treating him like a loose cannon, like someone who needed to be contained. As if he hadn't spent a whole year alone looking out for himself without any help from anyone. He wasn't going to be treated like a kid. He wasn't going to let them. Hadn't he earned his place? But Mooney, Remus, had given Sirius that pained, pleading look, and it shut him up. He hated making Remus uncomfortable. It made him worried he would never get better. He knew he wasn't right in the head. He knew he was going about things all wrong, and he was not himself. But Sirius had hoped a year would be enough. He was out now. He was free. Everyone who mattered finally knew the truth. It would make a difference. He should be normal again by now. Remus wasn't helping, Sirius thought darkly. How could he get his head straight when everything was so weird? Remus, his only friend left, could barely look at him without wincing, could barely speak to him without trailing off, glancing away. And the boyfriend. Sirius wondered how quickly that had happened, how soon the muggle had wormed his way in, infected Remus with his mundanity, made his moony quiet and cautious, no better than a muggle himself. It was like a light in Remus had dimmed. Sirius looked for the signs of the old Mooney, but there was none of that wicked, mischievous energy, that blistering strength of Remus Lupin when he had an exciting plan. It had taken Sirius ages to convince Remus to just go to the meeting. In the end, he had the impression Remus only went as a favour to him, to keep him calm. That was fine as long as he went, and when he got back, he would tell Sirius everything. Sirius would make him. It was the least Remus could do. Remus would come around. He would see there was no other way. He would want to do it for Harry. Sirius couldn't help smiling to himself, thinking about Harry. That incredible, brilliant, brave kid. James would be so proud. James. James, I'm so sorry. He shuddered, shut his eyes again, bracing himself against the cold. He wanted Remus so badly. He didn't want to be alone. Not again. Please. All right. Grant sauntered into the room as if to remind Sirius that he was not alone at all. Grant smiled at him cheerfully as he came in. Sirius watched him warily. Always bloody smiling. Weirdo. Good afternoon, Sirius replied, deliberately accentuating his enunciation to counter Grant's horrific butchered English. Sirius had spent no time whatsoever with muggles, even before Azkaban, and found them confusing at best, like an alien species and he hated Grant's cheerfulness with every inch of his being. "'Feeling better?' Sirius grunted non-committally. He didn't see that he owed any kind of explanation to this man. He tolerated him, for Remus's sake, but that was about it. Sirius thought he must be incredibly stupid. "'Wipe that inane grin off your face!' barked the spectre of Walperga Black. Sirius remembered Grant as a teenager, and he hadn't even been that good-looking then. Fifteen years hadn't improved on his hairline or his skin. Sirius had no idea what Remus was still doing with Grant at all, and if he was as stupid as well as plain-looking, 
then Sirius was even more baffled as to why Mooney would want him around. The Remus he knew, his Remus, would never suffer a fool. When he gets back, Grant was saying now, still cheerful, still smiling, showing crooked teeth and a white scar in the corner of his mouth, I'll go. Oh, okay, Sirius shrugged. He searched for something to say. We need milk. No, Grant chuckled, shaking his head lightly. He sat on the coffee table directly opposite Sirius, so close their knees almost touched, and looked him in the eye. I'm not popping out to the shop. I mean I'm leaving. What? Sirius frowned. Why? Did Remus tell you to? Because it wasn't my idea. It's my idea, Grant said, no longer smiling. He had tired eyes, and Sirius realised that though Grant was smiling, he wasn't happy. He was very, very sad. Sirius didn't know what to do about it. He had his own problems. Grant kept talking. I realised it a while ago. When he came back from the school, all shook up from seeing you again. I think I must have known then. Should have called time. But I just couldn't leave him alone. Look, I don't know what you think. I was only ever looking after him for you, Grant said, raising a hand to keep Sirius quiet. I was... I was never it for him. That's been you. All these years. And yet here you are, Sirius muttered. He drew his knees back up, closing inwards. He wanted Grant to just go away if he was leaving. Get lost. He'd like to transform into Padfoot, but he knew it wouldn't help matters, and he promised Remus not to. See, now this is what I wanted to talk about, Grant said, his brows knitting together. If I go, then you've got to look after him, okay? Not blame him for whatever's happened to you in the last ten years. Twelve years, Sirius corrected. Don't care, Grant shrugged. It's not been an easy life for any of us, Sunshine. You're not special. Remus is. Grant's voice was suddenly hard and dangerous, almost aggressive. He's special to me, and if you're not man enough to be kind to him, then you don't deserve him. He's been waiting for you. He never stopped waiting. He won't say it, because Remus don't say stuff like that, but he feels it. He feels everything. You must know that. Sirius didn't reply. He loves you. Grant said steadily. You have to love him back. I do love him. No. Grant was shaking his head again. Not like this. You have to be here. A real flesh and blood person. Not a dog. Not a ghost. Sirius couldn't meet Grant's eyes any more. He bowed his head and nodded. I will. Good. Grant smiled again, his face gentle once more. Now when he gets moody, and he will get moody, don't let him mope, and don't let him drink. He'll want it, after a full moon, but it only takes him longer to get well again if he does. I know what he needs after a full moon, Sirius growled, affronted. I've known him since I was eleven. Who do you think you are, telling me? I'm the one who's been here, Grant returned shortly. I don't think you know how hard it's been. I don't think you... Look, you had him at his best, okay? I had his worst. He smiled a little. And I was glad to do it. I have one part of him. You have the other. Can we agree? Sirius stared at him a bit longer. Grant held out a hand to shake, and Sirius took it. Okay, he said. Lovely. Grant released him and stood up. He went into the bedroom and came back with a large hole doll, which he placed very purposefully by the door. Gonna have to leave a few books and things here for a bit, he said, but I'll be back for them when I'm settled. Suppose you don't need a key, eh? Can you get in the magic way? Sirius nodded, struck dumb. He couldn't believe this was happening. He wanted his heart to soar. He wanted to feel finally satisfied, but he couldn't help worrying. Grant had been a nuisance but he'd been a buffer, too. Would Remus blame him for it? Would he convince Grant to stay, or even worse, would he leave Sirius here, alone with the flat and the war, and... There was a quiet shuffling noise outside the front door, and Sirius's ears prickered. Remus was back. 
His heart began to thrum against his ribcage. He licked his lips and sat up straighter, focused in on the door as it opened. Remus entered, head bowed, frowning a bit. Sirius couldn't believe how little Remus had changed, when everything else in the world was so different now. He was greyer, but he was still moony. He was still completely, devastatingly handsome and completely unfazed about it. He gave Sirius a smile as he came in, which was so like the teenage Remus it took Sirius back to Hogwarts, arriving at the breakfast table and finding Remus already there, on his third helping of bacon and eggs, grinning at something stupid Sirius had just said. See, he told himself, there are still some good memories left. Hello, he said to the room. Aya, Grant replied. Cup of tea? Oh, yes, please. Remus nodded, giving Grant a friendly smile. The muggle went into the kitchen. How did it go? Sirius asked, already agitated. Did you see Dumbledore? What did he say? No, oh, nothing much. Nothing I haven't heard before. The Order needs a new HQ. We're all supposed to come up with ideas. Look, let's talk about it later. Remus shot a glance at the kitchen where Grant was making tea. Did he say anything about me, Dumbledore? How's Harry? Harry's perfectly fine, back at his aunt and uncle's for the summer. What's this bag doing here? Remus was looking down at the brown hold all packed with Grant's things. He looked at Sirius. Sirius shrugged, slouching down in the sofa. Remus frowned and called out, Grant, what's this bag doing? Grant popped his head round the kitchen corner, looking sheepish. Ah, can I have a quick word? Remus paled visibly and went into the kitchen. Chapter 188 Till the End Where are you going? Remus hissed as he marched into the kitchen. He didn't want Sirius to hear them fighting, but things didn't look good at all, not from the way Grant was calmly stirring his tea, not making eye contact. Brighton, Grant said. I've had a job offer, a really good one. Better pay and I can help more people. I can really make a difference. But we live in London, Remus. You're just up and leaving me for a job? Remus was gearing up to start shouting, to shame Grant into staying. Grant just smiled sympathetically and shook his head. Don't be silly now. You know it's about more than that. Remus's heart was beating fast. He felt sick, woozy, as if the floor were rocking back and forth. You can't do this! I'm just making things easier for you, Grant said, and from anyone else that might have sounded bitter. Have I always tried to do that? But I love you! I love you too, my darling, but I'm not sure that's all there is to it. So you're just making this decision for me? I'm making a decision for me, Grant said very firmly. He looked at Remus now, dead in the eye, and Remus could see there would be no more arguing. Sirius needs you now, and you'll go to war, because that's who you are. You're mad and brave and incredible. There isn't a place for me in all that, so I need you to let me go. We'll always be friends, won't we? Care home yobs together? Remus wanted to wail. He wanted to fall to his knees and clutch Grant round the waist and hold him there forever, to beg and plead. He knew that was selfish. Grant was right. Remus had already decided to rejoin the Order. He had decided the moment Sirius returned. It wasn't fair to keep Grant around for that. It was downright dangerous. But he needed him. Oh, he really, really needed Grant. Remus wasn't sure he could do it all alone. Not with Sirius the way he was. You'll break my heart if you go now, Remus said, aware he sounded sulky and petulant. Grant shook his head lightly, holding his ground. I'm sorry, love, but it's breaking my heart to stay. And in an instant, Remus understood. He saw Grant properly for the first time. Not as his protector, his champion, but as a person who was not so very different from him, who was just as vulnerable to suffering. It's not a proper goodbye, eh? Grant said softly. You're not shot at me yet. I haven't always been fair to you, Remus said. He'd wanted to say it for a long time now. 
He wanted some kind of forgiveness. You've been fine, Grant smiled without a trace of blame. You've been my little bit of magic. Remus made a strangled noise and tried not to cry. Grant hugged him and they held each other for the last time. Grant left Remus in the kitchen with two cups of tea. One for Remus, one for Sirius. Remus stood in silence and waited for the door to go. He heard it shut. He covered his mouth with his hands and closed his eyes. He breathed in and out for a few moments, then walked into the living room. Sirius was still on the couch. He looked anxious, rubbing his hands together. Remus, I... No. Remus held up his hand, shaking his head. No, I need a minute. He went into the bedroom and closed the door. He sat on the bed and cried and cried. Once that was done with, he washed his face and went back to Sirius. There was much work to do. Monday, 10th of July, 1995. Things were harder after Grant left. Remus felt as though he'd lost his rock, the person who kept him safe for 13 years. The man Remus was left with was practically a stranger a gaping hole of misery and fear and vengeful rage. Remus was on eggshells and the war stretched ahead of them. Would it always be like this? They kept focused on the war, mostly because Remus refused to discuss Grant or his feelings. It was too much in those early days. They spent their time working on lists of contacts, getting in touch with the old crowd, digging up old information from the last war. Sirius hooked them back into the flu network using a secret connection only accessible to the right people, and time and time again the two of them knelt on the hearth rug, speaking into the flames, Sirius explaining his story to each member. Few of them took much convincing. All of them believed that Voldemort was back and wanted to do something about it. When they weren't working for Dumbledore, Remus put the TV on, and more often than not, Sirius would transform into Padfoot and doze off. Remus did all the cooking, Sirius offered, but Remus wouldn't allow it. He said he wanted Sirius to rest, to recuperate, but really he just wanted to be in a different room most of the time. Sirius still slept on the couch, because neither of them were able to broach the subject. Full moon on Wednesday, Remus said one afternoon. They'd just signed off with Kingsley, an aura Moody had brought in, who seemed pretty capable. Remus wasn't sure what that was worth. He'd seen plenty of capable wizards die. I know, Sirius said brusquely. They sat side by side on the couch, blankly watching the TV. It was only the muggle news, but it might as well have been static for all they cared. Just a reason not to look at each other. I usually leave an hour or so before sunset, Remus continued. Gives me time to clear the area if I need to. I remember how it works, Sirius said. Okay, sorry, Remus muttered, irritated. Just thought you'd want to know, but if you've got other plans, then by all means stay here. Sirius looked at him. Oh, you want to go? You want me to come? Only if you want to, Remus said hurriedly. I don't mind either way. Dumbledore said I need to stay here at all times. Fine, stay here then. Remus folded his arms tightly across his chest, feeling hurt. No, I'll come with you, Sirius said. Great. Remus drawled sarcastically. It was how almost all of their conversations seemed to go. One of them would deliberately misunderstand or become unreasonably defensive about a tiny matter, then the other would just bite back, round and round, until they both just stopped talking and ignored each other. But if Remus got up or made to leave the room, Sirius would give him that terrified look. Where are you going? And Remus would sit back down again, and the whole scene would reset. He thought that by bringing up the full moon it might cheer Sirius up a little bit. Sirius had always loved full moons, and it meant he could leave the flat for once. Can't you just be normal? Remus found himself thinking angrily. I don't want to live with a stranger. I want my best friend back. I need help. Then he felt guilty, because obviously Sirius couldn't help it, and if he really thought about it, they'd always been a fractious couple. They were both hot-headed Gryffindors, after all. Still... Sirius may not be a complete stranger, but he certainly was strange. Had he always been so watchful, so quick to anger? Or had Azkaban done that to him? Or, worst of all, was it all Remus's fault? Without Grant there, Remus began to wonder whether he seemed different himself. 
Perhaps years of living like a muggle had made him less interesting. He was slower than he had been as a teenager, more cautious. He rarely laughed. It was stupid, but Remus even worried about how he looked. He'd never been a vain person. He'd always been very ordinary-looking, scarred and a bit gangly, even when Sirius had known him. But at least back then, Remus had been young. Now his hair was grey all over, only a few strands of the original mousy shade left. He had more scars than ever, and sometimes he still smoked, which made him cough like an old coal miner. He was so much less than he had been before. This isn't going to work, is it? Sirius said abruptly, breaking Remus's thoughts. No tact. Once he'd been so silver-tongued he could talk anyone into anything, could reel off dirty jokes like they were romantic poetry. But now everything Sirius said was sudden and blunt and full of raw urgency. What isn't? Remus asked, shaken. He kept his eyes on the TV. This. You and me, in the same room, trying to act, trying to be okay with each other. After everything that's happened at fourteen years, it's just going to be too much. Remus finally turned to look at him, ready to be annoyed again, but found that Sirius was staring at his hands, twisting them hard in his lap so that the skin pulled and his knuckles whitened. He had scars too now. He didn't look so old and strange then. He just looked at Sirius, and he was frightened. Oh, I don't know, Remus said softly. He reached over and stilled Sirius's hand with his own, weaving their scarred, bony fingers together. He caught his eye and smiled encouragingly. You were always too much for me. I never minded. The look of relief which flooded Sirius's face was worth every moment. It was an entire lifetime. He raised Remus's hand to his lips and gently kissed the inside of his palm. They returned to the TV after that, but kept holding hands. Thursday, 14th of July. Thankfully, the full moon was a welcome change of pace. They apparated to the Brecon Beacons together and both transformed on a mountainside. The wolf was thrilled to be reunited with its old companion, and they spent much of their time chasing foxes through the grasslands, running together for miles and miles. They were better together in their canine bodies, more natural, more at ease. Perhaps the lack of inhibition, or perhaps the bond forged between them as dog and wolf was not as easily broken. When Remus turned back at dawn, Padfoot licked his face gleefully, nuzzling into him, and Remus laughed for the first time since Sirius had returned to London. They were still smiling when they got back to the flat, and it felt bigger than before, less of a cage. I forgot how strong you were, Sirius beamed full of energy. I forgot you were faster than me. Of course you did, Remus grinned. Arrogant prick, I could always beat you. He picked up the post sitting on the doormat and flicked through, as Sirius flung himself onto the couch, sprawling out. It was the first time Remus had seen him look really relaxed in their flat again, and it made him warm inside. Flicking through the bills and takeaway leaflets, Remus stopped short as he reached a postcard. It had Grant's new address on it. Nothing else, just the address neatly printed. The needle-sharp sting of regret hit Remus, and he sighed heavily. There was no phone number. Either Grant didn't have one yet, which seemed very unlikely as he was barely off it normally and needed one for work, or he was telling Remus not to get in touch. "'What's up?' Sirius said from the couch, ever watchful. "'Nothing. Grant's new address, that's all,' Remus put it on the mantelpiece. "'I really need a lie down. I think I'll go to bed.' He downed some painkillers, only the over-the-counter stuff, nothing exciting, and went to sleep. Luckily, that was easy enough after a full moon. When he woke up, the bedroom felt cold and empty. It was long after midday, and he could smell bacon cooking, the salty, savoury scent wafting its way through the flat. He got up and followed the scent into the kitchen, where Sirius was standing over the hob, agitating a sizzling pan of bacon and eggs. He turned, seeing Remus, and smiled. "'Thought you'd be hungry!' You're always hungry. Yeah, Remus nodded, yawning and scratching his head. Cheers. Remus made the toast quickly using his wand. He was getting back into the habit of using magic again, now that his last ties to the muggle world had been cut. They sat at the table in the living room, and Sirius even made an effort to use a knife and fork. Remus smiled at that, remembering James and Sirius's impeccable pure-blood table manners. He will come back to me. 
Remus told himself, as Sirius buttered his toast daintily. Bit by bit. The postcard from Grant was still sitting up on the mantelpiece. The image on the front was of Brighton Pavilion. I'd better start boxing up the rest of his things, Remus said, thinking out loud. Find a way to get them to him. He said he'd come back when he was settled, Sirius said unexpectedly. Oh, Remus blinked. Did you talk, then? A little bit, Sirius shrugged, faking nonchalance. Just to say goodbye, he told me to look after you. Oh, I see, Remus said quietly. Well, sorry about that. That wasn't his place to say. He very much wanted to keep these two halves of his life separate. No, it was okay, said Sirius. They were quiet for a bit and eating, and then... When did it happen? Sirius asked, back to his sharp abruptness. When did what happen? You and him. How soon after? After I went to prison. Remus set down his fork. Why are you asking me that? I'm just trying to fill in the gaps, the stuff I missed. Something inside Remus grew hot and fierce. I don't see what Grant has to do with any of it. Do you want a list of everyone I've shagged since you've been gone? Sirius breathed in sharply at that. No, of course not. Well, then, leave him out of it. He's gone now, that's that. I shouldn't have asked. I just thought... I never cheated on you, Remus said, hardening his voice. So you can stop wondering. I never, ever betrayed you. Even if you think I did. Sirius frowned and looked down at his food. You are still angry about that, then. I don't want to be, Remus said. I don't want to be, but I am. You thought I was a spy, Sirius. You thought I would try to hurt Lily and James. You thought I would try to hurt you. I was confused, Sirius said, his voice small. Everything was such a mess. Everything was so difficult. And no one knew anything. No one trusted anybody. I remember, Remus snapped. I was there. I still trusted my friends. Sirius kept staring at his food, but Remus wasn't finished. This had to come out eventually. He knew how it felt to leave things unsaid. Do you know how stupid I was? Do you want to know how completely dense I was in those last months? I thought you wanted to break up with me. I wanted to come back from the pack and see if we could make things up. It never crossed my mind that you thought I was a... I mean, fucking hell, Sirius. I loved you. Remus, I loved you and you left me with nothing. Do you understand? I had nothing except a lot of scars and a drinking habit. So don't start interrogating me about the bits of my life I've been able to put back together. Remus stood up and paced, the last of the full moon still hot in his veins. He stood by the window. He wanted to smoke, but he'd learnt by now not to give in to those kinds of urges. The kind that felt good, but would probably kill you in the end. The kind of urges he got when Sirius was around. I'm sorry. Sirius's voice was still very small. He was hunched forward, his hair in his face. Pitiful. Remus felt terrible, even though he knew he deserved an apology. He hadn't meant to be hurtful. For fuck's sake, he scolded himself. Why can't we ever get this right? No, I'm sorry, he said, steadying his voice, remembering to be understanding. I didn't mean to be so... I understand. I swear, Mo Remus, sorry. I swear I thought about you every day. What you must think of me. What you must have heard. I was the stupid one, not you. I should have trusted you. I should have told you about Wormtail being made secret keeper. I mean, bloody hell, we should have made you secret keeper. Merlin, when I went to Godric's Hollow that night, I... I just lost it. I would have done the same, Remus sighed. I'd have killed Wormtail. Sirius, I'm sorry too. I wish I hadn't believed them. I wish I'd tried to investigate, done something to help you. I was just in such a state I barely went out. I was never sober. That stuff's all my fault. And that's why I needed Grant. 
Sirius nodded, forlorn, still sitting at the table. It was too much. The air was too thick. Here, are you finished? Remus asked, needing a subject change. I'll do the washing up. Thanks for that, it was perfect. He cleared up the plates and took them through to the kitchen. He folded up the last of Sirius's fried egg in a piece of toast and scoffed it. Waste not, want not. Sirius came in just as he was chewing. Same old Remus, he snorted, finishing everyone's food. I know, Remus laughed, slightly abashed, turning on the taps. Grant used to call me the human refuge unit. Once he ordered a set meal for four from the takeaway downstairs, but got stuck in a work call, and by the time he came back, I'd eaten a lot. Sirius took this anecdote pretty well. He came to stand beside Remus and took up a tea towel, so he could dry as Remus washed. They did this in companionable silence for a while, but Remus knew Sirius was building up to something. His body was giving off that agitated energy that Remus recognised from long ago. Were they going to have a fight again? He hoped not. How long was he here? Sirius said softly. How long were you? A long time, Remus replied, concentrating on the dishes. It's good that you had someone, Sirius said with remarkable humility. I'm glad you weren't alone. He was better than I deserved, Remus agreed, glancing at Sirius to check it was okay to continue. I never thought I'd... I didn't think I could ever love someone who wasn't you. But I did. I loved him. Sirius opened his mouth but seemed to think better of it and closed it again. He nodded, a shadow of disappointment crossing his face. He was trying so hard. Remus put down the last dish carefully and wiped his hand on his jeans. He turned back to face Sirius, who was watching him like a hawk. I loved him, Remus said. But he wasn't you. Sirius's eyes widened, hopefully. Remus gave him a small, shy smile and a tiny shrug. Sirius leaned in, and all of a sudden they were inches apart, and then they were kissing, clutching each other tightly, as if it was their first and last. It turned out you never really lost the knack. Like an unbroken spell, Remus felt every moment come flooding back to him as vividly as though it were yesterday. Not the fights or the war or the emptiness, but the joy, the thrill of friendship and the love. So, so much love. Remus felt as if he were being filled up with it. He was spilling over. Just as it had been the very first time, Remus's brain seemed to be yelling, Yes, yes, yes! And he held on to Sirius with both hands. You're mine, you're mine, you're mine! When they broke apart, they were both grinning, pressing their foreheads together, holding each other's shoulders as if they were fighting or falling. I love you, Sirius whispered. I love you so much, he squeezed his eyes shut. Don't worry, you don't have to say it back. Of course I love you, you idiot, Remus gasped, not sure if he was laughing or crying. I never stopped. Sirius laughed too, though his cheeks were wet, and kissed him again, and again, and again, and again. They weren't teenagers any more. They finished the washing up and returned to the couch. Sirius suggested playing a record instead of the TV, and Remus acquiesced, willing to give him anything he wanted. He selected Diamond Dogs first, but Remus thought the lyrics to We Are the Dead might be too hard to hear. In the end, it was Hunky Dory, which had happier tunes on it. Sirius stretched out, his head in Remus's lap, and Remus stroked his hair and bent over to kiss him whenever he liked, because he could. At last, he could. I missed you, he whispered. Sirius squeezed his hand and turned his head slightly, obviously not wanting Remus to see the emotion on his face. He cleared his throat. Tell you what I've missed, he said, a smile playing on his lips. That serious black grin. Smoking. Haven't got a fag, have you? They're bad for you, Remus tutted. They'll kill you. We're all dying, Sirius replied. Maybe, Remus agreed, lacing their fingers together. But shouldn't life last longer if it can be like this? They fell asleep on the couch, probably because they were both too shy to suggest moving to the bedroom. Remus awoke to birdsong in the early hours of the morning, still upright, stiff, hips aching, the warm weight of Padfoot in his lap. 
He scratched sleepily behind the dog's ear, pushing him away to get up and use the loo. When he came back, Sirius was back to himself. Sorry, he said. I keep turning in my sleep. I think I spent too long as a dog in Azkaban. It's fine, Remus smiled. I don't mind at all. He stretched. What do we need to do today? Is there anyone left on the list to talk to? No, we've done everything, Sirius said. Except find a new headquarters. Hey, I had a thought about that. What about that old church you stayed in with the werewolves? Oh, that. Uh, No, probably not a good idea. Greyback knows where that is. He's still around, then. Mm Mm-hmm. Tea? Please. Remus went into the kitchen and Sirius followed him, still talking. I just thought that would be good because it's the middle of nowhere, so I could be there too. I hate the idea of you having to go off to meetings and me staying put. Don't you like it here? Remus raised an eyebrow. He loved his little flat. Other than Hogwarts, it's the only place I've really felt at home. Oh, Remus, Sirius squeezed his arm. You've gone all soft in your old age. Piss off. Remus snorted, giving him a light nudge with his elbow. We didn't all grow up in mansions. No, but... Hey! Remus, that's it! Sirius was shaking his shoulder now, jogging Remus as he tried to pour the milk. Oi, watch it! What? My mansion! Or it's mine now, anyway. My parents are both dead. I'm the Black Heir. The house will answer to me! Oh, I see. Remus frowned, turning to look at Sirius properly. Are you sure? I mean, you really want to go back there? Well, no, obviously I don't, but it's probably one of the most protected houses in Britain. The Blacks took home security really bloody seriously. There are enough rooms for all the Weasleys and then some. Oh, Merlin, imagine my bitch mother's face if she saw I invited the Weasleys over to stay. It's something I can do to help, isn't it? But serious, think about it. You'll be in the home your parents lived in. All their things will be there. We'll chuck it all out, Sirius waved a hand. And it's so safe. A safe place for Harry, Remus. It does sound, Remus thought hard, coming round to the idea. If you're sure. Of course I am. And anyway, it won't be half as grim if I have you there with me, will it? Ah, Remus poked him. Now who's gone soft? They got in touch with Dumbledore via the fireplace, and even he sounded impressed with the idea. He wanted to know how to get in, what sort of charms and curses Sirius knew about, how soon he could alert the Order. We'll need to give the place a proper clean, Sirius said eagerly. It'll be full of junk, but I can help, if I'm going to be there all the time and no one is better with magical pests than Remus. An excellent idea, gentlemen, Dumbledore's eyes twinkled through the flames. And right under Voldemort's nose, in the home of his most loyal supporters. How soon can you get there? Tomorrow, Remus said quickly, because he knew Sirius had been about to say, right now. We'll go after dark so it's less suspicious. Good man, Lupin, Dumbledore said. In that case, I shall await word from you. His face vanished in a puff of smoke. Yes, Mooney! Sorry, Remus, Sirius cheered. Amazing! Let's pack! Of course, Sirius barely had anything to pack, and was much too excited to be sensible anyway. That was left up to Remus, who began making a list of all the things they would need. Books, of course, all the notes from the First War, clothes, food, bedsheets. Remus didn't know how long Grimold Place had stood empty. He wasn't sure if any of it would be salvageable. I can show you my bedroom! Sirius trilled. Oh, teenage me would be so jealous getting Remus Lupin in my bedroom. Ha, Remus snorted, folding up clothes and stuffing them into his trunk. And just wait till Harry arrives. We can sort out a room for him, and when the war's over, it'll be his. Remus smiled and kissed him and agreed it would all be lovely, it would be an adventure, because that was what Sirius needed from him just then, and he was determined to do everything Sirius needed, for as long as he could. I can't wait to see Andromeda, and her kid. Must be in seventh year now, surely. Hey, imagine if she and Harry fall in love. How completely mental would that be? Then he'd be, what, uh, my second cousin? Once removed or something like that, Remus acknowledged. What are you talking about anyway? They're almost a decade apart. We were thirteen when Andromeda had that kid. 
And Moody, the old codger, and Arthur, and Gideon, and... Sirius, no, Remus said gently. Remember, Gideon Fab died. Oh. Oh, yeah. Sirius's face fell, and Remus felt dreadful. Perhaps he couldn't just go along with everything. He touched Sirius's hand. It's okay. You're already remembering things much better than a few weeks ago. Maybe, Sirius said, uncertain. He rubbed his arm. I think I'll go have a rest. Is that okay? Of course. Remus finished all the packing, and when he went back into the living room, Padfoot was curled up on the couch again. They ate a light meal for dinner, and Remus had the TV on because it was his last night round all of his muggle comforts. They still decided to take all of their old records, though plenty had warped over time and gave off an unpleasant hissing noise over the music. With everything packed away in trunks and boxes, it felt very final to Remus. But perhaps this was just nerves. He tried to stay calm, watching the sky outside turning a deeper shade of blue, the streetlights turning from pale pink to thick amber, and the stars beginning to show. Light pollution in London meant the stars were rare. You could only make out the very brightest ones. Sirius's head was nodding against his shoulder already, as the TV announced the nine o'clock news. Remus yawned and flicked his wand at the screen, turning it off for the last time. Oi, he whispered to Sirius. Come on, let's go to bed. Mm. Remus had to shake him a bit, but finally Sirius staggered up and wandered zombie-like down the hall. Remus brushed his teeth and washed his face, then followed him in. Sirius was standing by the bed, biting his lip. Come on, Remus yawned, climbing under the covers. What's wrong? Um, nothing. Sirius got in slowly. Remus pulled him close, so happy to have him near again. He wrapped his arms round Sirius's body and inhaled the scent of him, and buried his face in that beautiful hair. He felt so good. He felt complete. He kissed Sirius's cheek, searching for his mouth. Love you. Love you too, Sirius returned, though he was very tense and turned his head away. What's wrong? Remus asked, pulling away. Am I being too... No, I just... Sirius pulled back too. I, sorry, I just don't think I can... You know, any more. Oh, Remus blinked. Oh, Jesus, I'm s sorry, I didn't mean to. No, of course not, if you don't want to. No, I want to, Sirius squirmed. I'm just not sure I can. Since Azkaban, um, there's not really been a lot going on, if you know what I mean. I might not... Uh, I just don't want you to think it's you. Oh! Remus blinked again. He really didn't know what to say or do. This was not a problem he'd ever encountered before. He wanted to be kind. I'm just glad you're here, he said truthfully. I don't need anything else. Really? Really? Sirius turned around and took Remus's face in his hands and kissed him long and deep. That would have been enough, truly, honestly. Remus would have been happy with Sirius's lips, Sirius's taste and scent, but after a while Sirius pulled back and grinned. Doesn't mean I don't want you to try. And Sirius just about dissolved. It took a very long time. There had to be a lot more kissing, a lot more coaxing and gentle caresses and heated whispers. It took hours and hours. But how could Remus complain when he finally had Sirius sighing in his arms again? It was so tender and so, so beautiful. Afterwards they lay exhausted and hot and happy. Remus felt as if every hair on his body was singing, every nerve ending humming. Sirius curled into his body and stroked his scars like he used to. Hmm. Hmm. Remus? Yes? Can I ask you one question? Oh, Remus smiled. If you really must... What have you been doing all these years, Moon? Sorry. No, it's okay. Call me Mooney. Mooney, he sighed happily. What have you been doing? When we called around everybody, they were as surprised to see you as me. They said they hadn't seen you for a very long time. Since the war, Remus confirmed. Since Lily and James. Why? Sirius asked, frowning. I couldn't bear it, Remus said simply. Being around anyone who knew what had happened, I've seen Mary once or twice, but no one else. 
I wanted to be alone. Sirius shook his head, looking frustrated. I don't understand you, Mooney. No, Remus smiled softly. No, you never did, quite. Fair enough, Sirius accepted. He lay back onto Remus with his whole weight, though that wasn't very much. It was pathetic, really. Two bony, wiry men clinging together, both old before their time, and both so lost. They'd never understood each other. Not really. You've always tried, though, Remus said into Sirius's hair. He wrapped an arm round him and kissed his head. You still knew more than anyone else ever has. Ever will. Even though I thought you were... We don't need to talk about that. Sirius gave a half-sigh, and Remus knew he disapproved, but they've done enough talking for now. They were quiet for a long time, and Remus closed his eyes. Finally, Sirius spoke. Even if we don't talk about it, don't you think we ought to try to forgive each other? You sound like Dumbledore, Remus snorted. Ah, Sirius said. Yeah, you're right. Can you believe we're back following orders from that old fool? I suppose I don't really know much about forgiveness. Me neither, Remus sighed. I don't know if it's worth anything, really, with lives as short as ours, Sirius said sadly. I think at this point there's only love and hate. That's very fatalistic of you, Remus commented. I thought I was supposed to be the pessimist. Sirius shuddered slightly, which Remus took for a laugh. He squeezed him tighter and kissed his shoulder. Love and hate, he murmured thoughtfully. Love or hate, I suppose, Sirius clarified. You make a choice. It's that simple, then. Yeah, I think it is. Sirius reached for his hand under the duvet. He looked up at Remus, eyes now icy grey, but as piercing as ever. He was asking a question. Remus squeezed his hand in answer. Love, he said. And then he kissed him. Thank you for watching, and a very special thank you to our supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can head over to our Patreon or check out some of the official Bibliobabuli merch. If you're new here, consider subscribing, and until the next video, happy reading.